Assalamu alaikum. Good day, everyone. I would like to welcome you to the second and last session of the third ICMR conference 2020. Our first session three weeks ago had a great success, and we're hoping that this one will be as successful or even more. We will continue our theme on the antimicrobial resistance with a full session covering its challenges from different healthcare worker point of view, in globally and our experience in UAE. We'll also cover the management of COVID-19 in critical um, unit. And I would like to thank our sponsor, GSK, for this uh, conference, sponsoring this conference, and our organizers, InfoPlus, our chairpersons, and you, our audience. So let's start without any further delay. Our first session will be about preparedness and response to COVID-19 and operational review, which will be presented by our professor, Dalia Samhuri, who is the regional manager Country Health Emergency Preparedness and International Health Regulation uh, in Cairo, part of the World uh, Health Organization. Professor Dahlia, please start your session. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you very much for having me in this, uh, in this conference. Okay, these are the learning objectives, uh, pretty much the topics that I would be covering in this presentation. Uh, I will be going quickly through uh, the current situation in terms of the global epidemiological update with a little bit of focus on the region, the Eastern Mediterranean region. Uh, what is exactly WHO normative functions? Uh, in other words, what are the mandate? What is the mandate that we're focusing on? What is the progress that we have so far um, in the response to the different um, areas? And uh, what are the many challenges that we're facing? And a little bit of uh, for the way forward. So if you move to the next slide, um, it's basically a graph that shows um, the epidemiological curve uh, in the different regions, uh, the WHO regions, whether Americas, the Eastern Mediterranean, Europe, uh, etc. But if you, as you can see, we in the last uh, three months, we're seeing an increase in the number of cases. And um, basically, we have crossed many regrettable milestones, including surpassing of 1 million deaths. Um, I have highlighted the few events here. Uh, in April, we had uh, more than 100 million, 1 million cases. End of June, we had more than 10 million cases. Uh, for um, uh, middle of August, we have more than 20 million cases. And again, unfortunately, uh, end of September, we reached uh, more than 1 uh, million deaths. And at the moment, we're talking about more than uh, 43 million of cases. Um, and the situation is pretty much different from one region to another. Uh, so if you can move to the next slide, which is a little bit of focus on each, um, on each region. And as you can see, um, every country and every region is experiencing a unique epidemiological uh, progression. Many countries and mainly in the European, Eastern Mediterranean and parts of the Americas have observed a second resurgence. Again, unfortunately, we're seeing uh, the number of cases of this second wave uh, is much more higher than what we have seen in the first wave. And also we have witnessed um, a decrease or a reduction in the, num in the number of deaths. But unfortunately, we're seeing those uh, numbers are increasing again, and particularly in Europe and the Eastern Mediterranean region. Uh, it's pretty much, uh, uh, I wouldn't say scary, but it's worrying the, the situation um, in um, uh, some parts of the world. And then this is where we keep um, advocating and promoting uh, what are the main uh, areas that countries have to focus on in order to uh, bend the, the curve again and uh, whatever gains some of the countries have achieved in the past, it will be good to, so, to see those achieve, achievements um, coming up again. Uh, moving to the next slide. Um, so basically, this is uh, a little bit of an update on uh, the situation in, term, in terms of the age and gender distribution. Um, I mean, maybe you know that we don't really have all uh, the line listing of the cases that have been reported so far. Um, so the analysis of around the 17 million cases shows, shows that uh, the distribution between males and females is pretty much equal when it comes to, to cases, uh, but we are seeing uh, more deaths among uh, the males than the females. And if we look into the, the, the age factor, it's true that at the beginning of the outbreak, uh, the majority of the cases 
Uh, and of course, the deaths have been uh, within the category of 65 and above. Uh, but in the last uh, couple of months, we're seeing an increase in the number of cases among the different age groups, and particularly uh, the young age groups. And this might be related to uh, different factors. One of them is the opening of schools or the opening uh, or the relaxation of the different uh, social distancing measures. Uh, but we're still seeing uh, the mix is pretty much concentrated among the older age group and not among the younger age group. And if you move to the next slide, um, and this is uh, the map of uh, WHO. Uh, next slide. Yes, thank you. This is the map of WHO. And as you know, uh, we have been classifying uh, the transmission of the virus into four categories of uh, the, the, cl the classification of that transmission, uh, countries with no cases or countries with sporadic cases, cluster of cases and community transmission. And as you can see, the countries that are in dark orange or red, basically these are the countries that are experiencing community transmission. And the community transmission, again, the level is pretty much different. At the moment where we are um, reviewing uh, the classification of WHO to introduce more categories with the community transmission. Uh, so we can, uh, we can classify countries in a better condition somehow. Uh, so we have countries with community trans transmission that are focused on one part of it, uh, other countries where they have a community transmission across the whole country. So the revision of the, the classification of the transmission is undergoing and that will be again put on um, uh, well, the WHO website where we have all the material related to COVID. If you move to the next slide, um, this is pretty much the WHO global strategy that has been put in place, but also has been updated uh, based on the epidemiological situation that we're seeing so far, and also based on the response measures that uh, countries and WHO and partners have been putting in place. Uh, this global strategy is focusing on um, uh, main objectives. One is to make sure that uh, sectors and communities are working together. So we're looking for uh, one society, uh, whole of uh, uh, society approach or whole, all, all of country approach. Uh, the second main objective is uh, to control the sporadic uh, or the cluster of cases in order to prevent uh, reaching uh, the outbreak to a community transmission level. The third one is related to suppressing community transmission by making sure that we have the right measures uh, in place that would help in minimizing or in breaking uh, the transmission cycle. Um, the, the fourth one is uh, reducing mortality. And by reducing mortality, you wanna make sure that we're really uh, identifying um, Identifying, I'm sorry. Okay, I guess, yeah. I'm using my phone, I'm really sorry, and it's pretty much not easy. Um, again, the, the objective on reducing mortality is by identifying the vulnerable groups and making sure that we have the right measures in place that would prevent them from going into complications and uh, dying after that. And the last strategic um, uh, objective is focusing on, de on developing uh, safe and effective vaccines and therapeutics. And this is basically going on through a lot of work that I will, I will be talking about it through the, different, the, the coming slides. If you move to the next slide, um, uh, the purpose of this slide is really to highlight the fact that, uh, and, and again, I'm just taking it from um, uh, the achievement that Dr. Farida highlighted in her presentation and how important is the multi-sectoral coordination. And this does not only apply on, on the country level, but this is the same situation that we have to see at the global level, at the international community level. So from, from the perspective of WHO, we're really working as one UN system. We're not working alone, but also we are recognizing that health cannot be moving alone. It really has to be part of the overall package uh, but uh, uh, and this package is whether development or humanitarian it really depends on the situation in each country but the most important thing is that we're really putting countries in the heart of our uh, global response and this makes things uh, easier and this makes it uh, more practical for us to put um, uh, guidance or tools or procedures that are tailored uh, to the country situation and that can be easily uh, implemented uh, uh, this is only a sample of the different UN agencies and partners that we're working on with. And just to highlight a few examples, we are continuing to lead the UN crisis management team. We're co-leading the UN interagency standing committee uh, on the response to the humanitarian settings. And also we are working with OCHA to have a global humanitarian response plan. 
there is the UN framework for the uh, immediate socioeconomic response. And this is pretty much addressing the different uh, socioeconomic complications that countries have been going through with the understanding that health cannot go alone. It re when we want to see improvements in the health perspective, we really need to tackle the different angles uh, and most importantly, the socioeconomic uh, conditions. And if you move to the next slide, um, this is pretty much a little bit of, uh, of what WHO has been focusing on. In other words, what is the norm normative function for WHO in terms of, the, of leading policy and uh, technical guidance? So apart from the fact that there, is, there has been plenty and plenty of documents that has been produced so far, and I'm sure that uh, all colleagues who are joining uh, this conference, maybe they have built this habit of checking the WHO website to look into the different guiding documents. But the most important thing is that with this different guiding documents, we're really covering the different areas of work, whether it's surveillance, clinical management, whether it's um, uh, issues related to essential functions, issues, issues related to schools, issues related to points of entry, issues related to laboratory diagnostics. And uh, we have been so far reaching out to countries, not only by making sure that they receive these documents, but also uh, we're conducting a number of webinars, um, training uh, exercises to make sure that those different documents are easy to implement on the ground. We also have uh, managed to conduct uh, more than 100 uh, visits to countries um, to evaluate their preparedness, but also to evaluate uh, their current response to Corona, what is the main challenges that they're facing and how we can support them to move uh, the response uh, forward. If you move to the next slide, um, and this is pretty much a kind of a translation of what we're doing on the ground. Uh, one of them is making sure that we, uh, we do see the multi-sectoral coordination on the ground, but also this is reflected with the type of work that WHO is doing. Um, the, the SPRP or the Strategic Preparedness and Response uh, Plan for COVID is one example. Each country has developed this plan, uh, and these plans are pretty much linked to the regional plans and to the global plan with uh, monitoring and eval evaluation indicators that would facilitate uh, monitoring the implementation of those plans in terms of where things are standing and how those plans can achieve uh, the, uh, the different milestones have been put in place. There is a lot of work in terms of expanding capacities with that, uh, related to surveillance, testing, uh, contact tracing, managing cases, quarantine, isolation, etc. And, and this piece of work uh, did not really start with COVID. This has been ongoing for quite some time. I'm sure everybody has heard about the international health regulations. Dr. Fatma uh, Latar, who has been our uh, arm on the ground in terms of all the work uh, that has been uh, done related to IHR. She has been really a great advocate for IHR implementation in the United Arab Emirates. And we really have seen a lot of progress uh, and um, uh, this is absolutely uh, uh, something that needs to be acknowledged, not only in the amount of work that has been done, but also the level of coordination that has been achieved in, in this country. It's very important always that we don't build a system uh, that is parallel to the exist existing system, which means that we always have to build on existing systems. So um, the response to COVID, and this is what we have seen also on the ground, how did we use the influenza surveillance and uh, testing capacities um, being used for uh, COVID? Uh, the fact that we have a polio network in some countries in, in, um, in, in the world, uh, this network has been also used for the early detection, um, referral to, uh, to testing, etc. But also the existing rapid response teams and their important role in the contact tracing, the investigation, etc. Logistics has been um, a great challenge. Uh, and, and, and again, um, just to acknowledge what uh, Dr. Farida um, uh, referred to in her presentation, uh, there is uh, great examples that we have seen on the ground, but I think what, um, what is really our achievement in terms of the region is the Dubai hub that we currently have with the support of United Arab Emirates. Through this hub, we really managed to, uh, to ship uh, tons and tons, I mean, thousands of tons and millions of tons to different countries, not only in this region, but also in uh, uh, the different countries uh, in the whole world. And this is, again, one great example, uh, and it shows really how the knowledge is translated in the ground. And if you would move to the next slide, this is a little bit of the work uh, that we're, we're trying to push, to push forward uh, uh, during the course of the response. One of them 
uh, is of course science and and the, the process of developing applications and, and guide, guide, guidances. So we have established a crit critical COVID response, a uh, new fast track review. Uh, we also establish evidence collaborative for COVID network. Uh, and we have of course the WHO library that um, people have access to it, including open uh, access citation. And by having all of this, this really uh, helped us to ensure strategic publications of technical documents and their appropriate timely dissemination, quality assurance, consolidation of guidance by team. The review process does not really take time. Take time. So within 24 to 48 hours, we have documents reviewed uh, and going through the publication process. Uh, more, than 100, more, than, more than 200 publications. And of course, uh, a different number of documents for the governing bodies where uh, different resolutions usually come out from these governing bodies. The point is that we have put a mechanism in place to fast track all the work that we're doing in order to be able to come out with uh, the great amount of publications and guiding documents that countries can benefit from. And of course, this is a snapshot of the web page that I'm sure everybody is familiar with. If you move to the next uh, slide, and uh, this is really uh, an area that One I would like to highlight. Left. Yeah, um, if you can give me a couple of minutes, I'll try uh, to rush quickly through the different slides. Sure. So I just wanted to highlight uh, that data is the heart of our work. Without data, we're not able to function. And this is something that we, we have been uh, facing a lot of challenges in terms of receiving data from countries. If you move to the next slide, um, this is all uh, the progress that we have uh, seen so far in terms of scaling up the surveillance and tracing of contacts, case definitions, uh, guidelines, and the Go Data, which is a software or an application that can help in the tracing of contacts. Uh, and the most important thing, we always promote how we can build on the influenza system inside countries. Next slide, uh, this is all the work that we have been uh, achieving so far in terms of scaling up laboratory capacity in countries. Um, the networks that we have been working with, the guidelines that we have produced, that the, um, the um, um, recommendations related to the different uh, reagents, and this has been of great use in countries. The next slide is related to infodemic and risk communication community engagement, uh, just to highlight the amount of work but the most important thing is how we always focus on communities and we make sure that communities have to be part of all the work, otherwise we're really struggling. And this is a great example from countries where engaging communities is important. Um, next slide is basically showing uh, the supply chain uh, system. I will not go through details, you have the slide, but the most important thing is that we have main principles that really guide this piece of work. And this um, uh, graph in front of you shows you step by step how the supply uh, chain system works. Uh, next slide, uh, this is all the work that how we have been doing related to case management capacity, technical guidelines, working with the expert networks, uh, uh, issues related to um, enhancing, increasing the number of beds, issues related to um, oxygen supplies, ventilators. It's really a big piece of work uh, that basically has been of importance to uh, a lot of countries. Uh, this data is just a snapshot of what has been achieved so far. Next slide is on the research uh, and development and uh, the act. And the act is a just very important initiative that has been uh, launched by WHO. And the most important um, uh, objective of this act is to make sure that we really coordinated the work that is related to vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostic um, the agents. The research and development work has helped us also to come out with the research agenda. And this, is, has, this has been our work with partners to focus on the priority research agenda. Um, for the solidarity trial that uh, I'm sure the majority of you are aware of, so far we have more than, more than 12,000 um, patients uh, recruited, um, 500 hospitals participated, and of course this has been uh, part of uh, the participation of 29 countries in the solidarity trial to come out with uh, evidence that would help us modify the guidelines related to therapeutics and vaccines later on. Uh, next slide is where things are standing related to vaccines. Uh, just the most important thing is that at the moment we have um, nine vaccines in the third, uh, the phase three uh, trial. And um, I'm sure that uh, uh, Dr. Farida also talked about it, but without going into details, we really hope that we have something uh, by the end of this year. Uh, but again, we always highlight the fact that this cannot be used before mid of next year and to make it available to all countries that will not be before 2021. 
Next slide. Uh, these are the drawbacks that we have seen in terms of uh, disruption in essential health services. And this is a major area of work for WHO to support countries to revitalize the disruption that has been taking place. Uh, but just to highlight, NCDs, uh, cancer management, mother and child health were one of the most, some of the areas that have been disrupted because of uh, COVID. Uh, my uh, last couple of slides, uh, many challenges that we have seen so far. Uh, the public health measures in terms of the social, uh, the social distancing measures. What has worked, what did, what did not work, what, what is the evidence behind it, uh, the fatigue that countries are going through. Uh, also, uh, in terms of the healthcare workers, the infection prevention and control programs has been one of the many challenges in the majority of the countries. Behavior change as well. Uh, is additional challenge in a way people are going through fatigue and therefore trying to change their behavior to adapt the preventive measures is pretty much uh, very challenging. Uh, this is uh, the last, uh, almost the last slide. Um, I just want really to highlight that this COVID is really a stress test on how countries were prepared. Uh, the international health regulations has different ways of looking into the country preparedness uh, some of them has been working, others are, are not. But uh, the, the point is, that I'm trying to make here is that there is really still a lot of work that needs to be done to enhance preparedness capacities. And we really need to build on the achievements that we had so far from the international health reg regulations. Moving uh, to the next slide, additional challenges related to travel and trade. I can um, uh, elaborate more on this during the questions and answers. Uh, but this has been, uh, again, another area where countries have been not complying with IHR when it comes to the implementation of additional measures. And my last slide on the way forward is basically three main, um, uh, three main objectives. Last slide, please. Three main objectives that we want to focus on. We really we need to continue to prepare, empower, uh, and respond to this outbreak in, uh, in a way that we need to strengthen preparedness readiness uh, and response capacities. We want to make sure also that we are accelerating the development and access to safe and effective tools and ensure, of course, the fair distribution globally. And the most important thing is we want really to make sure that all the work that we're doing is part of the health system strengthening and it's not uh, coming out as, an, as a parallel system to the existing challenge, to the existing achievements on the ground. And thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, Professor Dalia. It's always great listening to you. Moving to our second speaker, uh, Dr. Zulfa Dici. She is consultant microbiologist and head of the pathology department in Latifa Hospital. She is also the head of the TB Central Lab, uh, as well as the head of the infection control unit. She will be talking to us about a very important topic, which is antibiogram for clinicians. We all know that clinicians are usually not very much aware how to interpret the antibiogram. After this presentation, all of you will be able to do so. Dr. Azulfa. Thank you, Dr. Ashraf, for the nice introduction and thank you to Dr. Najiba for inviting me to talk here. As you know, the microbiological analysis starts with the suspicion of infection by the clinician followed by the sample collection that should be transported quickly to the lab Gamila for analysis with Gamila conventional or molecular uh, microbiological analysis. If we move on with the, my, with the conventional, it's mainly the gold standard, which is the culture. From culture, we identify the pathogen and we do susceptibility testing. And from here is the uh, importance for the clinician from the antimicrobial susceptibility, we produce an antibody which is specific for the uh, organism uh, combination with the bug that is used directly for targeted therapy of the uh, patient. Okay. Uh, through the year, we collect all the data from the uh, single anti uh, antibiogram. We, and we produce uh, what is called institutional antibiogram. This institutional biogram is then used for empiric therapy as well as for producing policies and uh, guidelines in the hospital. For this presentation, we will focus on the second part of the uh, topic from the susceptibility testing onward. 
But we have, uh, so we will talk about uh, basics of antimicrobial susceptibility, how we interpret the antimicrobial susceptibility, what is its limitations, what is institutional antibiogram, how we interpret it, and what are the limitations. Uh, all of you know that microbiological uh, or clinical microbiology is a science of interpretive uh, uh, judgment. So the result depends basically on the specimen that is collected and sent to us. The specimen that should be properly collected, fastly transported to the lab in, in, in order to uh, produce an accurate and reliable uh, report. Very important note here that not every negative culture means that the patient is free of infection. It simply can mean that the sample was not collected properly, collected after antibiotic was administered, or uh, simply it was delayed to reach the lab. At the same time, not every positive culture means infection. It can be colonization or contamination, again, if it is not properly collected. And you can see how this can impact uh, so many aspects of diagnosis and treatment in addition to increasing the cost. So in the lab, we have to identify, after culturing the, the, the sample on the right media, we have to identify the uh, organism to the species level in order to be able to test the right drugs and to interpret the susceptibility. What, what is susceptibility testing? Susceptibility is basically uh, testing the ability of a specific organism to grow in uh, the presence of certain uh, drugs. We have several methods in the lab for testing the susceptibility. The first one I want to talk about is the, what we call disc diffusion, where we place impregnated discs with antibiotics over the growth which is flooded on the uh, petri dishes and we measure the zone of inhibition. The second method which is the gold standard for susceptibility which is the broth dilution which tests several dilutions of the antibiotic against a fixed inoculum and here we, uh, we report the MIC or we, we, we look for the uh, MIC, sorry. And a more recent uh, version of the uh, MIC testing is the E-test, where the same uh, uh, concentrations are uh, placed on a nitrocellulose a strip, and we measure the eclipse between the growth and the uh, reading corresponding to the MIC. Of course, recently we started depending on molecular methods where we test for the resistant genes and we report certain resistant genes for the organisms. Whichever the method of sensitivity we use, the goal is to predict clinical success or failure of certain antibiotic being tested against a particular infection or particular organism. In order to be able to categorize the antibiotic uh, as or the organism as susceptible, resistant, or intermediate, we have to refer to certain interpretive criteria, which is produced by uh, international organizations like the CLSI and UCAST, where they analyze three uh, types of data, microbiological, pharmacological, and clinical studies before that drug is issued for use, and they give us something called the breakpoints. So the, great, the correlation between data obtained in vitro and the clinical efficacy in vivo depends on a complex of factors, including the site of infection, the ability of the drug to reach the target site, the dose and effective drug delivery are also important in terms of pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. So the organism is reported susceptible it means that that drug may be appropriate choice for treating infection caused by the, the bacteria tested. If it is resistant, means the organism is unlikely to respond and uh, you might get clinical failure. And if it is intermediate, it means it's in between. It is in the zone buffer between being reported as susceptible or resistant. These antimicrobial with intermediate 
uh, category can be used in body sites where there may be uh, the antibody can be concentrated at the, at the focus of infection, for example, like UTI, or maybe when the doctor would like to use a higher dose uh, if he can do that safely. So what is a minimum inhibitory concentration and how do we measure it? We, uh, as you can see here, we have uh, microtubes we, where we prepare serial dilutions of the antibiotic. We inoculate with a specific inoculum of that uh, tested bacteria. We incubate and we look for the visible inhibition of growth. In the example in front of you, you can see that the bacteria was able to grow at concentration of one, while, while it was not able to grow at concentration of two. So two is considered the minimum inhibitory concentration for that bacteria against that drug. So how to decide that this reading is supposed to be reported as sensitive, intermediate, or resistant? As I told you, there are standards which are established by the uh, international organizations like the CLSI, which tell us the break points. What is the break point? The break point is the value of the MIC or the zone diameter, which differentiate the organism between susceptible, resistant, or intermediate. Take this example. So the, the, the organism here, the shaded part, it shows that the organism was able to grow in 0.12 uh, concentration at 0.25, but was not able to grow at 0.5. So if the breakpoint for sensitivity here is at the first arrow, which is less than or equal one, and the resistant is more than, sorry, and the resistant is more than eight, this means that if I get MIC of 0.5, this organism will be susceptible to that antibiotic. While if the growth continued until two or four, I will report it as intermediate. And if I still get growth at eight or 16, then this is reported as resistant. And this is how we categorize and report the antibiotic to you in, uh, in similar format to the form in front of the uh, screen. The breakpoints are specific for combination of bacteria and antibiotic. So for each bacteria or bacterial population, there are specific points against that certain antibiotic and it's different with other antibiotics. So never compare two antibiotics based on the uh, MIC or based on the breakpoint. Suppose an antibiotic A has an MIC of one and antibiotic two has an MIC of two. It doesn't mean that one has uh, double the efficacy of uh, two. It simply indicates that the concentrations achievable by giving recommended dose of both drugs are likely to be active against that organism. MIC, exact MIC reporting can be helpful for clinicians in cases where uh, they, they don't have options. Uh, mainly. So suppose that an, I, I get an organism which is susceptible to meropenem at one, and I know that the breakpoint is less and or equal one. So you, if the doctor wants to use meropenem for this drug, he might like to watch the uh, patient for success. He might increase the dose if he can do that safely, or he might, might add another antibiotic to achieve better success. So in the lab, you have to report antibiotics that are relevant to the organism testing, relevant to the site of infection, and of course, available in your formulary. Interpretive reading is very important. It's not everything in the lab is sensitive, is reported as sensitive, and everything is resistant, reported as resistant. We should, uh, in the lab, be able to uh, recognize unusual results and recognize mechanisms of resistance using indicator drug. For example, we use oxacillin for staff to tell us that if oxacillin is resistant, the organism will be resistant to all beta-lactams. So uh, all of you know that bacteria has uh, resistant mechanisms and these resistance can be natural. It means 
the, it is there for all the uh, species of that organism, yeah, and or it can be acquired, which is as a result of mutation and under the pressure of antibiotics. Examples of natural resistance, for example, enterobacteriaceae resistant to penicillin G or to glycopeptides. I can never report, for example, glycopeptide for a member of enterobacteriaceae. Proteus mirabilis is always resistant for nitrofurantone. So if a doctor tells me, so let me uh, see the result of nitrofurantone, I'll, I'll tell, sorry, I don't test it because it's naturally resistant. Ciferoxime can show sensitive in vitro. However, you cannot use it because, and you cannot report it because it is naturally resistant. And there are many other examples of this that the lab should be aware of. Other type of resistance which is acquired and which is increasing and the Dr. Tibor, Professor Tibor presentation was a very good example of how we are doing in terms of that. Examples are of those are the extended beta lactamases, which are as the result of the misuse or of the, or the overuse of cephalosporins and, uh, and uh, quinolones. So what is extended spectrum beta lactamases? They are enzymes that can hydrolyze third generation cephalosporins and monobactams. So even if these are showing sensitivity in vivo, in vitro, they have to be reported in, uh, as resistant. However, extended beta lactamase producers, the ESPL, remain uh, affected by the, the beta lactamase inhibitor. So in non-critical situations, in non-life-threatening infections, you can use augmentin or tazosin to treat those infections. And these enzymes are uh, always as a result of antibiotic misuse, as I mentioned. The other type of beta lactamases are the MC. They are similar to the beta lactamases. They, hard, they hydrolyze cephalosporins and, uh, and uh, monobactams. However, this group is not uh, is not inhibited by the beta lactam beta lactamase inhibitor. So if the organism is beta is MC producer, even in non life life threatening infections, you cannot use uh, tazosin or augmentin for uh, treatment. And there are similar uh, or many uh, situations where the lab has to recognize or even the clinician unusual uh, phenomena. Like if I get, for example, pseudomonas, which is resistant to cholestine, I have to go back to my culture and check, is it mixed? Is it another organism that is misidentified? Or maybe, you know, uh, it's a genuine infection. So I have to repeat, I have to do additional testing to confirm that. And there are many situations like that. Staff resistant to vancomycin needs to be confirmed and so on. The lab also should have a strategic uh, testing uh, guidelines, which is called antibiotic cascading. This means that although I test a battery of, organ of antibiotics, I should uh, have second, first line, second line, and third line. And I don't report the second line, which is more expensive and, uh, and the broader spectrum, if the first line is uh, sensitive. And this is a very important role of the microbiology lab in antimicrobial stewardship. Now I move to the second part of the presentation, the, the institutional antibiogram. Over the year, we collect all the susceptibility tests that we have done, and we produce something called cumulative susceptibility report. This is the overall profile of antimicrobial susceptibility uh, results of a specific pathogen to a battery of uh, antimicrobial drugs. And the traditional antibiogram looks like this. Here you have the, uh, sorry, you have a list of the uh, bacteria tested, the number of each isolate and the percentage susceptibility against each drug. For example, here you can see a, a, a portion of the antibiogram, like E. coli, 300 test, uh, isolates tested, 60% were sensitive to cefazolin, 85 to cefepim, and 95 to meropenem, and so on. So antibiograms, the institutional antibiograms, are used to help doctors in empiric therapy, and that is very important role of the antibiogram. Before the culture result is ready and the sensitivity is uh, ready, it's also used to assess local susceptibility, to monitor resistance, and to compare institutions with each other. 
So in order to produce an antibiogram in a consistent matter uh, all through constitutions and to have accurate and reliable antibiogram, again, CLSI has put guidelines. Data has to be analyzed annually. You can use biannually if you have a big number of isolates. Less than 30 should not be uh, reported because if you have a smaller number of isolates, then the uh, resistance will be exaggerated. Duplicate isolates has to be removed, separate uh, uh, antibiogram for each, ho each hospital, and don't include surveillance uh, cultures and re report only antibiotics that are routinely tested. Which isolates we use for the antibiogram? We only use the first isolates of a given species per patient per reporting period. If I get infection with E. coli in certain patients, for example, I take that isolate for antibiogram regardless if it is from urine or sputum or blood culture. So only the first isolate because the idea is to guide in empiric therapy and not in subsequent infections. We don't report multiple isolates because you know the patient when they stay longer, they start getting uh, resistant infections. And if we include those in the data, it will skew their susceptibility and overestimate resistance. Two in minutes. addition, two minutes. Oh, that's all. In addition, we don't include surveillance cultures because they don't, uh, they don't really represent infections. We only re report organ uh, uh, antibiotics, which are uh, uh, tested routinely and not re uh, tested against susceptibility uh, against resistant organisms. As a general rule, if you have a resistance rate more than 20%, you don't use that drug or it's not a good choice for, uh, use, uh, for use. And for critically ill, maybe you can go, go li lighter. It also, uh, the, the antibiogram helps you to monitor resistance. You can see in this graph, the resistance to kephalosporins, how it, we, we had it over the, from 2006 onwards, how the, it was increasing, and the emerging resistance from 2011 with the carbapenem resistant isolates. The same here with the resistant of acinetobacter. It also used to test interventions. Like in here, you can see that after 2010, we started seeing less and less uh, MRSA because of the screening of MRSA uh, uh, carriers. The same different, uh, different locations you can use and you can use to uh, compare your results with other constitutions. You, have, you can use the antibiogram to change your formulary if you have a resistant, infect, resistant uh, results for certain antibiotic, you might switch in your guidelines to another antibiotic from the same group. You might restrict certain antibiotics like meropenem if you have increased rate. And you can use subset of like combinations. If you see combination from the antibiogram, that is always sensitive, you can use that as first line in your choices. You can uh, report a stratified antibiogram like by location, ICU, different from the ICU, outpatient, different from the inpatient, urine specifically, blood culture specifically, certain population like cystic fibrosis who usually get more resistant pathogens and so on. Uh, another presentation where you can combine all the organisms ca causing certain syndrome like UTI as in here from different areas. You can see from this, if, if a similar antibiogram is reported to you, you can see that if I have a patient from the clinic, I have 93% chance to hit right if I use nitrofurantone, whether this susceptibility decreases for patients coming from ER who, who sometimes they are previously admitted and also higher resistance in uh, or, or lesser susceptibility in patients from the wards. Also, we can test combinations, like for example, in this graph, you can say CFP combined with amikacin can approach 98% uh, coverage, meropenem with amikacin 91 and so on. The same you can use also to test combination and to, to see which one of them at least can work. In the lower uh, table, you can see if I, for pseudomonas, if I use amikacin along with tazosin, the chance is both of them will work is 76%, and the chance of e each of them will work at least is 16 and 8. So I have zero chance if I use amikacin with pepracillin that I will not have uh, efficacy. So maybe I, this is a good choice for me 
to, to, to use this combination in empiric therapy of serious infections. Of course, you can give it as a guideline or pocket size or, or, or publish on a uh, website. A generalization from antibiogram, if you have a high uh, MRSA, it means infection, a poor infection control, high VRE, maybe misuse of vancomycin and so on. The limitations, it doesn't tell you that the patient developed resistant during therapy, and this is not the aim of the antibiogram. It doesn't tell you patients' factors, like for example, previous infection of the patient, past antimicrobial use. So you have to assist the patient if you can use uh, the, the, the antibiogram or you have to use his previous data or uh, his uh, targeted therapy based on culture and sensitivity. So a uh, final note is the timing of the initial therapy always should be guided by the urge urgency of the situation. You have a critical patient, you assess the patient and use the antibiogram to, uh, to, to find the most suitable therapy. If the patient can wait, like for example, in endocarditis, you send three blood cultures, wait for the susceptibility and give the best choice based on the uh, specific report. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Azulfa, for this illustrative, very well presented uh, slides about the importance of microbiology. And I always say that if the clinicians do not know how to listen to the microbiologists, they will never learn how to use the antibiotics. We are moving to our next presentation. Uh, and all the way from uh, West Virginia, Morgantown, West Virginia University, Dr. Douglas Slane. He is a double consultant in both clinical pharmacology and infectious diseases. He will be talking to us about the antimicrobial stewardship challenges from the pharmacy perspective. Dr. Douglas. Thank you, Dr. Ashraf. Okay, uh, this is my title slide. Uh, you can see um, <clears throat> my contact information was at the bottom of that slide. Um, I, I am a practicing uh, a clinical ID specialist, but a clinical pharmacy specialist. And I've trained a lot of individuals in antimicrobial stewardship and in infectious disease pharmacotherapy. Um, I have a faculty appointment at our schools of pharmacy and medicine, and I round uh, daily uh, many months on our infectious disease consult team and also work periodically in our outpatient infectious disease clinic. Um, next slide, please. So it is truly good to be back with you, although uh, virtually. <clears throat> I was fortunate to have spent uh, a week in, uh, in the UAE this past January before COVID really became what it became. And I learned uh, even more about what's going on in the UAE in terms of antimicrobial stewardship. Uh, during that visit, I was a, I was a visiting consultant uh, sponsored by the Ministry of Health. And I spent most of my time in two hospitals in uh, Sharjah and up in RAK at, at two of the uh, MOH hospitals and really got to know a lot of the physicians and pharmacists who are engaged in stewardship. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, these are my objectives. Uh, you can look at those for a minute uh, just to give you an idea of what I'll be talking about. I really won't be going into depth explaining you know, large parts about what stewardship is. I've been asked mainly to talk about you know, what is the, the pharmacist perspective in all of this stewardship uh, activity. Uh, next slide, please. Everybody here is, is clearly aware of the importance of, of resistance and many of the other esteemed speakers have, have spoken about this already. Um, here, uh, this just points out that the WHO has really been kind of a worldwide uh, champion trying to get us all to, to work together uh, and do the best that we can to limit uh, inappropriate antimicrobial use. Uh, also working in, in the tripartite mission along with you know, animal and environmental uh, issues related to this. Uh, this is just a slide highlighting when they put out the recommendation uh, talking about, you know, the, the important uh, types of antibiotic resistant pathogens that were most concerning worldwide. And at the top of the list were gram negative, multi-drug resistant gram negatives. Next slide, please. So, you know, this is something that, you know, I was a, a consultant visiting a hospital in India. Um, a few years ago, and you know, it was not uncommon to see uh, susceptibility reports for organisms that looked like this. Uh, this was uh, 
you know, this was at a time when NDM was around and Acinetobacter that was multi-drug resistant was very prevalent uh, in some of these hospitals. And, you know, we don't want our future options to look like this where we don't have anything. And fortunately, there are a few newer drugs on the market uh, that can help us. But again, we have to make sure we're good stewards with those as well. Next slide, please. Everybody uh, on the call today is probably aware that the WHO in 2015 uh, in particular uh, released the Global Action Plan and asked all countries to develop their own, uh, countries and regions that, for that matter, to develop their own response and global action plan to help uh, stem antimicrobial resistance. And a big part of that are the aspects that would go into what we would call antimicrobial stewardship. Next slide. Now the GCC uh, did put together, at least, you know, I'm aware of this, this is a published article, but I'm sure there, there has been more uh, put out from, the, from uh, many of the folks in the region there. Uh, in particular, I, I noticed that Dr. Najiba, uh, who's involved with this conference, is one of the, uh, the lead authors on this paper. Uh, this is the GCC plan uh, on how they were going to uh, react with the gap. Uh, and uh, within it, of course, they talk about uh, stewardship activities. So next slide, please. There are many different definitions for what an antimicrobial stewardship program is or should be. This is a, an early definition that came out. Uh, you know, you can see what it talks about. The only thing that this particular definition doesn't talk about is cost. Uh, many stewardship programs certainly can lower cost. And Honestly, it's how they justify a lot of them getting resources for them, like hiring pharmacists uh, and, and getting software to do the management because they can save costs. The other thing that's missing from this particular definition is access. Uh, we're always worried about excess, but sometimes access to quality medications is also part of the stewardship mission. Next slide. Now, stewardship, if you think about it, you know, and it, at its very heart is multidisciplinary. And not every stewardship program around the world has really thought uh, on how to bring people together to do that. Uh, the program at our institution is a very advanced model of stewardship. And part of the success is really attributed to the fact that we have so many people represented and we all come together frequently uh, and work together to make our mission successful. You can look at some of the, the different professions and specialties listed around this, this cartoon table. Uh, you know, this looks similar to what we bring to our antimicrobial stewardship uh, meetings. Uh, in the, and it's that group that really oversees a lot of the activities within our, our health system. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Uh, I think you're probably aware that the Infectious Disease Society of America was one of the our early uh, groups to really put out what are evidence-based uh, guidelines for, you know, what should be in a stewardship program and how to implement such a program. Uh, this is one of their, their earlier guideline papers, and they really tried to look at the literature and weigh the evidence from the publications that are out there. And honestly, a lot of stewardship studies are not of the, you know, highest uh, study design, but nonetheless, they, they collected and ranked a lot of the recommendations in, in this particular guideline, but also have had some subsequent guidelines, as well as other entities around the world. Next slide. So one of the key recommendations uh, really early in stewardship was the recognition that, that pharmacists were really going to be instrumental in this. And in particular, uh, and this is a direct quote from some of the IDSA uh, guidelines is, you know, they really feel that the two most essential leaders of a stewardship program are an infectious disease trained physician and a clinical pharmacist with infectious disease training. Now, both of these are sometimes rare at many hospitals. There just aren't enough ID trained physicians and pharmacists to run all of the stewardship programs across the world. So we try to manage, you know, as best as we can, but this is, you know, ideally what you know, what the best evidence suggests if you can, you know, fulfill these manners, okay? Sometimes we need to share maybe an ID physician across a, a group of hospitals and they might work with pharmacists that are either ID trained formally or informally or, or really are not. Um, and I'll, I'll be talking about some of the pharmacist training uh, as we move through these slides. 
Uh, next slide, please. So here, uh, this is a slide just talking about if you're not familiar, I know that we have a lot of non-pharmacists on the webinar today. Uh, this just talks about some formal training or, or degree or, or um, you know, residency training, things like that. So most pharmacists around the world, their entry level degree would be a bachelor's level pharmacy degree, which is either called a B-farm or a BS-farm. And you know, this really trains people well to be working in the community as pharmacists even working in hospitals and doing many things, working in, even in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, but that degree doesn't traditionally give them uh, ideal clinical training. So the more clinical training uh, degrees would be the Doctor of Clinical Pharmacy, which is the PharmD degree. Uh, and this is really the essential degree in the US. Uh, it's also becoming popular in Canada, uh, some countries in Europe and many countries in Asia and the Gulf. Um, in particular, there are degree programs in, the GC, in some of the GCC countries where you can get the Doctor of Clinical Pharmacy or PharmD degree. Other countries have opted to have some clinical focused master's degree programs and they're either MPharm or MSPharm. Uh, these are particularly common in the Commonwealth countries associated with uh, the UK, uh, but also in some Gulf region countries, there are some degree programs there. Now, where people get formal infectious disease training, uh, this would be the last grouping uh, there on the right. Um, you, completing a PGY2 ID residency. Now, right now, this is essentially mainly seen in the US. Uh, there are some programs being developed uh, potentially in uh, some other countries. Uh, there, um, I believe there is actually one being developed or is developed in, in uh, Saudi. Um, and uh, in some other countries for sure. Uh, this is uh, you know, some of the training that I lead and we do in the US and it's very thorough in training someone to do this work. In other countries, they develop a specific master's degree focused on infection management. There are a few programs in the UK that are doing this, but they are small in number. Another option for specialty training would be completing an ID fellowship as long as it also has a good clinical piece to it. A lot of fellowships tend to be a little bit more research trained, but you can have some that are uh, involved clinical training as well. Now, and in between here, you'll notice that I have the PGY-1, which is the general pharmacy residency. Now that doesn't essentially make, you know, it's not all about ID training, but you can learn quite a bit about ID training to be prepared to, to get into stewardship work uh, I know that for a fact in Abu Dhabi, there are at least, I believe, two uh, PGY-1 general pharmacy residency programs there, um, and they're very respected uh, from what I'm, you know, I don't have a personal knowledge about them, but I know that uh, they're regarded well. So you can get some very good training there that could help an individual uh, who wants to get into um, ID training. At the bottom, I point out that you know, a lot of people get their training, you know, they might have just been general pharmacists uh, without ID training, and they might learn on the job, or they might complete a certificate training program. Uh, two classic examples are the SIDP training program, uh, or the BSAC program, some individuals might do that as well. Next slide, please. So, you know, is there a difference if you have a pharmacist that has ID specialty training versus generalist training? You know, the preference is obviously to have ID training, but again, the numbers are very small, especially to find those that have very formal training. So we try to do a lot of train the trainer programs and, and get certificate programs out there. And, and they are available widely for pharmacists who want to, you know, take their general knowledge to become a little bit better to, to gain more ID uh, information and expertise. Now, both, even without specialty training, a pharmacist can be very effective. Uh, specialists have performed well in, in research protocols, uh, but nonetheless, um, generalists can be very helpful as well. Next slide. Um, you can skip this. There, are, there have just been many endorsements in the world literature uh, talking about uh, the value of the pharmacist to antimicrobial stewardship. So you can skip this slide, please. Next slide. Okay, so uh, FIP is the global pharmacy organization. It represents, you know, pharmacists and pharmaceutical scientists around the world. 
They have a close working relationship with the WHO. They recently released their new global development goals. And here you can see number 17, antimicrobial stewardship is one of those goals. And they really have in, encouraged um, you know, pharmacists to really get active in this in their, in their countries. And uh, for the most part, I think most countries are getting pharmacists engaged in it. Uh, we just have to make sure that they're getting uh, the resources and they're also um, you know, getting the support that they need to be successful and to help the mission of stewardship. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is a real complex uh, uh, slide, so I'll just sum it up. Uh, there was a survey by FIP that went out to about 72 countries looking at you know, what, were, what were things that hospital pharmacies did in terms of their service. And down in the lower right corner, you can see that you know, antimicrobial stewardship was something that they said that they did uh, you know, by a fair amount of institutions. Uh, but there's still a ways to go before it, it really becomes regular across the world. Uh, and this is a busy slide, so I'll, I'll skip it. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a kind of an important slide because, you know, uh, you know, professions often usually, you know, try often promote themselves uh, to gain key roles. And, you know, that's not helpful, you know, you know, if we work again, and, and I'll talk about the silo mentality, we really have to work together. And, you uh, you know, many non-pharmacist organizations like the ones listed here are really talking about the key role for pharmacists uh, in antimicrobial stewardship and really lead roles for them, uh, working closely with, with expert physicians as well. Uh, and, and again, other key uh, professionals. Um, I do wanna say that, you know, um, you know, just because the quote that I showed you earlier didn't talk about it, um, I, you know, microbiologists and infection preventionists are you know, also very key and very important in, um, in stewardship. Our program is very successful largely because, uh, you know, we do, we do um, partner and cooperate very closely. I mean, we have a very close relationship with our leads in microbiology and our infection prevention uh, program is very strong at WVU um, and we couldn't do what we do without them, certainly. Uh, here, this slide though does show you that there are many, and, and I could have filled this up with many more uh, agencies. You can see that, you know, the IDSA, the US CDC, the WHO, and even in the UK, the NHS, um, in addition to many others, really endorse a key role for the pharmacists in, in lead roles in, in stewardship. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, recently, our US CDC program. Um, has released you know what are called the seven core elements for developing stewardship programs they're very thoughtful um, you know i imagine many of you have seen these if you haven't seen there's actually a kind of a corollary that has come out uh, that they've developed actually for the purpose of actually helping you know either uh, middle low income or low resource setting uh, countries or uh, sub-national groups to uh, implement core elements uh, in those settings, and I have the, the publication highlighted in the middle of this. I'm not going to review uh, the core elements, but if you're interested, I refer you to, you know, you can Google this and find out more about it, but clearly the pharmacist uh, is mentioned throughout um, the uh, core elements uh, programs. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, again, I'm not going to go into all of these, you know, pharmacists, though, in the in the roles of stewardship can do just about every function that has ever been listed in stewardship. Uh, now, you know, they can't I'm not one to advocate that they run a stewardship program by themselves. Uh, clearly not. Um, you also always have to have, I think, an infectious disease uh, physician that you can really go to or, or an expert physician that knows uh, a great deal about, you know, you really have to know about, have somebody that can really know about diagnostics because a lot of the calls that might be made require that knowledge of diagnostics. Now, you know, pharmacists learn some, you know, about diagnostics and, and the importance in making judgment calls and empiric selection, it's, it's part of training, but you clearly have to have someone that is there as a resource that you can work with. Uh, also to maybe um, deal with, you know, if there are any, um, you know, uh, political issues and you really need kind of a, a high-powered infectious disease physician to kind of help 
maybe a, a surgeon or a transplant physician who you know, likes things their way and they don't like to make changes for the benefit of stewardship, it's good to have someone uh, that is an infectious disease physician. Uh, as you look at the list though, you can see a lot of the activities, you know, and some of these things for a long time pharmacists have been involved with uh, formulary selection, education, approval, certainly dose optimization. This is the pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics. It's something that even before uh, uh, stewardship was a thing, I mean, it was an expertise of clinical pharmacists. Uh, but, you know, you can look at a lot of these things. Uh, I will mention dashboard uh, monitoring as we move forward. Uh, let's jump to the next slide in the interest of time. So dashboards uh, are becoming really important. If you can get some of the IT support to do this, there are a number of software vendors out there, uh, or maybe your own uh, computer software uh, or uh, medical health record can actually implement a dashboard. And the pharmacists are the ones that traditionally will create and monitor a lot of the dashboards. So what they tend to do is they get data from our, our micro colleagues. They'll take the resistance data. They, they can actually calculate, the pharmacist will calculate drug usage by service, by physician, by unit. Uh, over time, they can compare it to other hospitals in the network or nationally. And they can really monitor in real time, you know, how things are going with resistance and antimicrobial usage. And a lot of this data can actually identify, um, you know, trends that might be something that your stewardship program will want to address. Uh, but their benchmarking value is, is tremendous, I will tell you that. Uh, next slide, please. Dr. Douglas, two minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, you know, the theme you know, that they asked me to talk about are challenges. Um, I think, you know, none of these would surprise, I think, some of the folks here. I know most of the people are from the Gulf region on today's webinar. Uh, these are things that came out of some surveys in some Gulf countries about what are challenges that stewardship programs are seeing. So these are people in the Gulf region that are uh, saying some issues that are challenges. Uh, resources and funding, um, lack of adherence to the guidelines, and lack of administration, administrative support either within the hospital or from the Ministry of Health. Um, a big one that also affects pharmacists, I think, and everybody is that we work in our silos, okay? There's this disintegration sometimes, and that really hampers effective communication and really would prevent uh, good stewardship practices. Shortage of well-trained personnel, um, certainly finding you know, good trained pharmacists to really do the mission uh, we really have to develop a lot of them in practice. Um, information technology, outsourcing microbiology. I know it's, it's common, but it's much better if you can really have a resource microbiologist within your hospital. And uh, physician fears and concern often lead to what's called defensive prescribing where they're worried about, you know, what if something goes wrong and I could be sued and, and things like that. Um, and that's a concern that, that is always gonna be a, an issue with stewardship. Next slide. So the next slide, we'll just have a few things talking specific about the pharmacists. You know, they are often underutilized. Um, they're often left out of key meetings, even though they might be part of the stewardship program. And you really need to make sure that they're incorporated at all levels so that they can really uh, help the process and, and give meaning. Um, and it's really cl uh, critical to have, you know, a champion. So, you know, if pharmacists are kind of doing their own thing and they don't have support from infectious disease physicians or the ministry or the hospital um, hierarchy, uh, they're really not being able to be used fully and effectively. Next slide. Uh, these are just some of the attributes of a pharmacist leader. Um, you can just look at some of those things. Uh, none, none of those things would really surprise you. Um, I'll skip uh, to the next slide, please. Lastly, I just have a comment that stewardship in community pharmacies, this is really the new frontier. And even in, in, in the US and the UK and in other countries, you know, this is uh, uh, an area we all need to work at. A lot of problems here. Uh, next slide. You know, access to antibiotics without a prescription and good guidance uh, is, is still a problem and we have to worry about that. But we also have to make sure that we're training pharmacists uh, well to deal with stewardship in the community. 
really being advocates for vaccination and not treating viral and, and many respiratory illnesses that don't need antibiotics. Uh, one other thing that you know pharmacists are getting very active in is managing quality supply chain. There's a lot of subtherapeutic drug out there and a lot of counterfeit uh, medications. So you have to make sure pharmacists in the community and hospital are buying quality, uh, reliable anti-infectives. Uh, also, pharmacists are getting involved in testing, and that can actually help preventing people from going to the hospital and requesting antibiotics. Uh, and they're actually get, going to get involved in COVID testing in our country. Uh, next slide. I think I'm probably done here. Yes. So uh, those are my comments. Uh, if there's any time, uh, I will hang around, but uh, I don't know if we have time for questions. Um, uh, my email is there if anyone uh, ever needs to reach out to me for uh, any additional uh, information. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Douglas. Uh, and, and now we have to move to our last speaker in this session, all the way from uh, University of Phoenix, Brighton, Colorado, the States, the Director of Infection Prevention Strategies, Terry Hewitt. She will talk to us about the synergy between infection prevention and antimicrobial stewardship. Terry, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, so I'll try and keep this brief and, and get us back on track. I'm just gonna review real quick infection prevention's involvement with antibi antimicrobial stewardship. Um, I'll talk about some of the key stakeholders that I've um, worked with as part of the antimicrobial stewardship team, and then um, describe the collaborative opportunities between infection prevention, nursing, and the antimicrobial stewardship team. Next slide. So here I want to just take a minute and um, share my inspiration. Um, because as I move forward with antimicrobial stewardship, Dr. Arjun Srinivasan from the CDC um, has just kept me on track. Years ago, I, I listened to him talk and he used to talk and he still does talk about how um, we're losing our antimicrobial effectiveness. And at some point in time, he felt that we would get to a point where we have no antibiotics to treat infections. Um, and we're kind of in that situation now with our um, significant multi-drug resistant organisms. So anyway, just to share a little bit about how I got started and what keeps me going with antimicrobial stewardship. Next slide. So first steps that in my experience has been to, to build your team. That team may not look the same from facility to facility and from setting to setting. And that kind of goes in line with what Doug talked about. Um, I liked his display about having different entities at the table, different disciplines, because everybody brings a piece of the puzzle. And that's the same with um, my work with infection prevention. So just making sure that we don't lose sight of those key people that need to be on the team. Next slide. We can kind of skip this, I'll try and keep this on track. Next slide. So, and again, following in with Doug said, roles that should be on your antimicrobial stewardship team. Physician and pharmacist are, are probably two of the, the biggest key ones and they carry the largest roles in terms of the work that they do. Um, infection preventionist, we should absolutely be at the table. Historically though, infection prevention has been a little late to the game and some have come kicking and screaming along the way. And the perception has been up until the last few years that infection prevention doesn't write orders. We don't prescribe medic or we don't administer the medications. We don't um, do the cultures that there really was not a lot that, that we as IPs did. Um, and so I've taken the role of showing how infection prevention really is a part of antimicrobial stewardship. Um, nurses are another piece of the puzzle that have not been um, recognized or utilized to the fullest of their potential in terms of antibiotic stewardship. There was a paper written um, in Clinical Infectious Diseases back in 2016 by Dr. Um, Rita Olins. And she really highlights how nursing should absolutely be at the table and the role that they play in antimicrobial stewardship that I'll go over a little bit. Next slide. Um, and again, it's interesting how my, my pr presentation really kind of keys off of a lot of what Doug shared. Teaching core elements, the core elements of antibiotic stewardship. 
And there are different core elements depending on the setting. So if you're in a long-term care or post-acute care setting, the elements will track along the same, but there will be small tweaks. So from a hospital perspective, I'm not gonna go into the leadership, accountability or pharmacy ex expertise, um, but infection prevention definitely can play a part in action and tracking, reporting and education. And I'll touch on those just briefly. Um, next slide. So educating your team, and this is kind of the big piece that I see infection prevention plays in antimicrobial stewardship. We've, we've built our team, we've got all the key people at the table, and now we need to move out the information that we're developing among that, that team. Um, and who's gonna do the education? Pharmacists tend to educate pharmacy and their peers, and those who might participate in um, daily rounds, but from a nursing perspective and getting out past that small group, it hasn't always happened. Um, so from an infection prevention perspective, that's where we come into play. We can partner with um, clinical nursing educators. We can make sure that nurses at the bedside who are giving the medications and obtaining the, the cultures and watching for the results to come back, know what they need to be doing, what they need to be looking at. Next slide. Um, from an infection prevention perspective, again, we don't do much with prescriptions and I'm not gonna go into that. Um, cultures, I'll speak about that. Um, monitoring results, and that's another key part. Not from a physician perspective because they're monitoring to change um, medications, to deescalate. Um, pharmacy does the same. They're looking at drug drug mismatch. They're looking at sensitivities and MICs and all of that. Um, I'll touch base on what we did with antibiotic classes and then device days. And so from, from my perspective, those are the key pieces that antibiotic stewardship can, or that um, infection prevention can take a role in. Next slide. Diagnostic stewardship, and I think Doug hit on this just a little bit. Diagnostic stewardship is a big piece that infection prevention and nursing can play a role in. Um, we can teach nurses to question when, when to um, question a culture or teach nursing not to ask for cultures in a patient who doesn't have clinical indications. So what we can do as infection preventionists is teach nursing, and some of our work focused around um, asymptomatic bacteriuria. Oftentimes nurses would see sediment in an in a indoor and urinary catheter bag or a res, uh, an older person would have concentrated urine um, and just look kind of funky. And so the first train of thought by nursing is, well, they have a UTI. So then they'd request a, a urine culture and that urine culture would come back and it might be just a dirty urine, but that person, the patient has no other clinical indications. So we worked a lot with helping nursing understand um, when to ask for cultures and, and when not to. Um, we worked with nursing around blood cultures as well. And part of what diagnostic stewardship talks about is um, making sure that the cultures that you're giving are good, that you're obtaining a good um, culture that will give good results. Um, kind of that garbage in, garbage out piece. Um, next slide. Okay, so Kind of as I, as I alluded to, we, um, the infection control department in collaboration with antimicrobial stewardship wanted to see if we couldn't impact blood culture contamination. In our facility, um, here in the US, we have uh, um, contamination rates that we want to stay under. Our benchmark is 3%. And in our facility, the benchmark, our, we were at uh, almost 7%. And so we, we looked at data, we validated what, the data that we were looking at. We identified where our, the majority of our blood cultures were coming from and then who had the highest rates. And so we um, provided education, we put together some specific interventions and um, then kind of moved forward to see if we couldn't make improvements. And over time, we were able to bring those blood culture contamination rates down from 7% to our ED, which was the highest um, unit with a contamination rate of just over six. 
they, we brought them down to 2.91 and our hospital contamination rate was 1.97. So we were able then to take that information, feed it back to the units and explain to them the impact that it had. We weren't treating patients for, um, blood cult for contaminated blood cultures. So they weren't getting antibiotics. They weren't having to have lines placed. They weren't staying in the hospital longer. And we weren't running the risk of adverse events from that antibiotic exposure. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is a busy slide, so I won't go into any great detail, but part of the work that we did was putting together um, education tools that were one page, fairly concise. And in terms of blood culture collection, we wanted nursing and the, um, the phlebotomists to understand certain processes that should be followed in if they were getting other blood work at the same time of the blood culture. Um, we had to explain why the two bottles, the aerobic, the anaerobic, we also worked with, um, we brought transport in, and like Doug said, we worked closely with microbiology um, to help understand why cultures need to get down to the lab in a specific amount of time. The, um, the harm if a culture sits up on a unit for hours and hours. Um, so again, just making sure that we had key people at the table and the work that we were doing. And, and our team could fluctuate a little bit depending on what our focus was. But the core part of the team stayed the same in terms of the physician, the pharmacist, the infection preventionist, and nursing. Next slide. Just another piece of the work that we did. What, one of what we discovered was um, there was no uniform process for blood culture collection. There was no um, uniform kit. So what was going on in our burn ICU could be very different than how cultures were collected in our neonatal ICU and very different than how blood cultures were collected in the ED. So we agreed to put together blood culture kits. Um, nursing took charge of that in the beginning um, and put them together on the floor with a, a sheet that went inside that walked somebody through A to Z in terms of getting those blood cultures. Eventually, after working with our supply chain, um, SPD or SCS took over putting those kits together and making sure that the kits that went out through the facility were the same. So if nursing was working on fifth floor, the blood culture kits looked the same as that that was on the um, third floor. Um, we worked with, with phlebotomists to make sure that they were using the same process. So, so we standardized what was being done um, and it seemed to work. Next slide. So another piece of the work that we did in terms of education, we, we realized that nursing um, didn't really understand the lab reports that they would look at. They would pull the lab reports up and oftentimes they didn't look to see what was sensitive and what was resistant. They might look to see that the antibiotic that the patient was on was listed on the, um, the report. But when we would delve into asking questions about is it sensitive or is it resistant, they really didn't know. So we educated on looking at a, a microbiology report we didn't, we didn't go into the MIC at all, and we didn't expect them to understand the MIC or the test range. We just wanted them to piece together the antibiotic and was it sensitive or was it resistant. Um, over time, we tried to help them understand classes of antibiotics because what we would get is a, a nurse would call and say, my patient's resistant to seven drugs on the list. Okay, so when we would go up and look, we would walk them through what's multi-drug resistant versus what is not. Um, and, and that seemed to play a huge difference. Um, okay, next slide. Again, just throwing this in because helping nursing understand classes of antibiotics versus just an antibiotic. And if they were looking at a, a, a lab result that had all of the penicillins resistant to something, but sensitive to everything else, um, helping them understand that piece of it. It didn't happen overnight. And I'll say nursing didn't necessarily come to the table um, 
eagerly, but once we helped them understand that they were already doing the work and how they could be involved with antimicrobial stewardship and become a, a true um, integral part of the team, we started to make headway with them. Next slide. Can I get the next slide? Okay. Another piece that um, we as infection preventionists could play in terms of um, helping nursing understand their role in antimicrobial stewardship and how we can reduce risk for infection. If we can reduce risk for infection, we can reduce risk to um, a, a patient getting treated when they didn't need to with an antibiotic. So we help them understand really assessing the need for the indwelling devices that their patients had. Um, and so my background is nursing. Um, I've been a nurse forever. And we, and, and specifically neonatal ICU. So those tiny people can be difficult to get lines into. And we, when I was at the bedside and as a charge nurse, if the physicians would say, let's get that pick line out or let's get that umbilical line out. I, I was notorious for always saying one more day. Can I have it one more day? Let's make sure the feedings are gonna go well. Um, once I got into infection prevention, I realized that that one more day was one more day of risk for infection. So going back, taking that knowledge and sharing it with nursing and helping them understand why just one more day is not just one more day um, and tying that into harm for the patients. Um, so I throw that in just as a piece that um, infection prevention can drive at the nursing and at the unit level from an antimicrobial stewardship perspective. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. Um, so in summary, the synergy, and, and that was the, the title of the um, presentation was the synergy between infection prevention and antimicrobial stewardship. Um, and really when you have a good team that works together and we each knew our role, we each understood what we brought to, to the table, that core group of us, the pharmacists, the physician, um, the nurses, Educators, we decided really were, clinical educators were key to the work going on because they could take it and run with some of the educational pieces that needed to happen at the bedside, at the unit level with nurses and CNAs and um, transporters and phlebotomists. Um, so infection prevention really should take a shared leadership role with respect to many of the core elements of antimicrobial stewardship. Um, standing side by side with that infectious disease physician and with that um, infectious disease trained pharmacist. Infection prevention can and should take the lead on education. And I think I've just highlighted a few of the pieces of that that um, we've done in my facilities. Infection prevention tracks all cultures. And so in terms of the um, core elements and reporting, we're already reporting um, to regulatory bodies. And so we can take the lead on reporting that information internally as well. Uh, it, it's important for facility, for units to understand the work that they're doing and the impact that it has. Um, diagnostic stewardship plays a key role in antibiotic stewardship. If we're not getting good cultures, if we're not um, taking care to get lines out when they don't need to be in, if we don't have all of those pieces covered, um, we have gaps that continues to leave our patients at risk. And then infection report, infection prevention reports specific positive lab results. And I mentioned that just a few minutes ago to our regulatory bodies. So from an infection prevention perspective in the facilities that I've been with, um, we did take the, leadership, the role to disseminate information. We had an open door with the C-suite. Um, so we made sure that they knew what we were doing, they knew how we were doing it, and they knew what we needed. And then we could show them by the um, infection rates and, and different data that we were collecting, how successful we were being or where we needed to make more improvements. Next slide, please. So I throw this in just to, um, for me, in terms of synergy, synergy requires a combined effort. And much like a rowing team, if that team's not all working together and everything, everybody on that team is not in unison, 
we tend to not to move forward in a, in a cohesive, collaborative production way or productive way. Um, but when that team is working together and everybody knows their role and really joins hand in hand moving forward with the work, we can reach success together. And, and that leads to improved outcomes and reduced risk for our um, patients. Next slide. So I think I'll end it there. I thank you, thank the committee for the opportunity for me to share some of the work that we've done and how um, I feel infection prevention really does provide a synergistic role in that um, antimicrobial stewardship team. Thank you very much. That was a great uh, showing of uh, synergy between infection control and the whole session actually was talking about a, a teamwork uh, for controlling antimicrobial resistance. We will now move to our last session, which is chaired by Dr. Zulfa Dc. She is the consultant microbiologist that already had been introduced to us. She's the head of uh, microbiology uh, and infection control unit in Latifa Hospital for Women and Children. Uh, Dr. Zulfa. Uh, good evening again, and welcome to the third session of our uh, program. Uh, our first topic is, is flu vaccine relevant in the era of COVID-19 by Dr. Jihad Abdullah. Dr. Jihad Abdullah is an internal medicine and infectious disease consultant, head of infection control and prevention committee, uh, committee Al-Rahba, and Hospital Infection Control Scientific Committee in Saha UAE. Please, Dr. Abdullah. Good afternoon to everyone. Thank you very much for attending this session about influenza vaccine in the era of COVID-19. Uh, our objectives is mainly to highlight the importance of influenza vaccine during this pandemic, increase the the physician's knowledge about the importance of influenza vaccine, discuss the barriers in, uh, in the way of influenza vaccine during this epidemic, and how dangerous is influenza infection with COVID-19 infection together. So let's start with this question. So influenza activity this season might be lower, lower, than, lower than last uh, uh, season true or false? And the answer is true. So usually when we uh, monitor the influenza activity, we always look at the Southern Hemisphere countries, let's say uh, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, Chile, uh, part of Brazil, Argentina, those countries uh, have the flu season uh, before us, before the North, Northern Hemisphere, and they can give us some uh, information about the circulating viruses and how to fix our vaccine, which strains we have to add. And from what, if, what we've seen, they had lower influenza season than the previous years. So let's talk about Australia, for example. Uh, in 2020 season, uh, which started earlier, as you can see, the, the continuous line in the bottom which the arrow shows you in the bottom, represents this year influenza vaccine. And the dotted lines represents the previous years. And you can see it's very minimal cases of influenza compared to the previous three years, 2019, 18, and 17. The same situation in Chile. So Chile has the same minimal influenza infection rate compared to the last three years the same uh, situation with South, South Africa. So why is that? Why do you think we have lower influenza vaccine uh, in this uh, Southern Hemisphere countries and we might have the same? In fact, this is the most likely, we're, we're assuming of course, but maybe due to social distancing and the other and preventive measures we uh, adopted in fighting SARS-CoV-2, and this helped the spread, or helped to reduce the spread of both infections. But still, influenza virus and SARS-CoV-2 virus can uh, uh, co-circulate, and both of them can give us co-infection 
which is really dangerous in people with comorbidities. So even with those assuring uh, information and data from Southern hemisphere countries, we should not let this give us a false sense of security. So uh, SARS-CoV-2 and influenza can present uh, if they co-infect someone at the same time, and mainly many uh, patients, this will put a tremendous burden on the health system and may, may cause a lot of illnesses, hospitalizations, and death, unfortunately. Influenza vaccine will decrease the stress on the healthcare system by multiple uh, means. Number one, by decreasing doctor's visits and hospitalization. So if you get the influenza vaccine, the likelihood that you will be symptomatic when you get infected with influenza is less than people who did not take the vaccine. So you might get no symptoms or very mild symptoms and you might not need to go to the hospital or get admitted. Also, well, uh, if you have less uh, vaccine, I mean, less influenza cases, then the likelihood of testing those people if they have respiratory signs and symptoms is less, which means we're gonna save the healthcare resources for COVID-19 infection and other conditions. So, Preventing influenza during the 2020 and 2021 season is more important this season than ever. Why is that? Because preventing influenza, of course, by giving the vaccine means fewer people will need or seek medical care and testing uh, uh, for possible COVID-19 influenza. Again, someone gets the vaccine, less likely to have the influenza, correct? So people still can get COVID-19, but the total number of people coming to the emergency departments and healthcare facilities with respiratory symptoms will be less for sure. Also, influenza vaccine could, uh, could offer valuable uh, lessons for ensuring vaccine acceptance and uptake for COVID-19 vaccine. So if you accept the idea of influenza vaccine, you're, you're open-minded to accept COVID-19 vaccine, which should be protective. So influenza vaccine is, the, is a major push to try to take uh, the influenza off the table. Meaning that if I give the influenza vaccine, I might have one less diagnosis for people coming to the emergency department or clinics or any healthcare facilities uh, with respiratory symptoms. And then we have one less diagnostic criteria. Again, why do we want to take the influenza uh, off the table when it comes to diagnosis? Because there is overlap in symptoms between COVID-19 uh, and influenza. If anyone tells you that for sure he can differentiate between influenza and COVID-19, I don't think he's, getting, he's telling you the truth. They have a lot of overlapping signs and symptoms. And even if there is overlapping in the population vulnerable to COVID-19 and the population vulnerable to influenza, the same kind of people will get admitted, get the complications from both uh, infections, and we'll come to this later on with, uh, with details. Also, the COVID-19 pandemic has influenced health-seeking behavior. So we have more people tend to come to the emergency department or to clinics with minimum symptoms because they're afraid of uh, COVID-19. They've seen their uh, relatives, beloved ones uh, getting sick. Some of them died of COVID-19. So with minimal symptoms, they will come to emergency department seeking help. And this will put a lot of pressure on the system, the health care system. And by giving the vaccine, we have one less diagnosis, one less disease to think about when we deal with such patients. Let's start, let's have another question. Which of the following statements is most uh, accurate 
reflecting current recommendation regarding influenza vaccination. A, all patients aged six months and older should be vaccinated against influenza with rare exceptions. B, influenza vaccination should be deferred in area where COVID-19 infection rate is above 5%. C, patients should not get vaccinated at physician's offices due to the risk of COVID-19 transmission. D, the intranasal influenza vaccine should not be used during COVID-19 pandemic because it is an aerosol generating procedure. And of course, all patients above the age of six months should get the vaccination with of course, very few exceptions. So again, the influenza vaccine should not let the physicians, I mean, the COVID-19 infection should not uh, let the physicians or the health system delay, defer other vaccinations, including influenza. So the core recommendation has, has been the same, hasn't changed. Uh, an annual influenza vaccine is recommended for all persons aged six months and older who do not have contraindications. And those are very, very limited and uh, rare, mainly anaphylactic reaction to influenza vac vaccine, which is extremely rare. So why it's danger to have influenza inf infection and COVID infection together in adults with chronic health conditions? If you have co-circulating and co-infection of influenza and COVID-19 viruses uh, affecting those people with chronic conditions, such as old age, heart problem, lung disease, immunocompromised, metabolic problem, mainly uncontrolled diabetes mellitus, the likelihood of complications for first hospitalization, complication, and sometimes death is higher than general population. So let's start with influenza infection here, affecting someone with chronic disease. And when I say chronic disease, we think about those chronic diseases that, can, that affect the patient's, uh, let's say immune cell, immune system, or ability to fight, fight viruses. People with, uh, let's say, uncontrolled diabetes, obese people, people with uh, heart problem, lung problem, uh, even uh, neurological uh, problem have higher risk. So when you have influenza vaccine affecting those people, you will exacerbate the chronic disease they have. Then you'll have increased rate of hospitalization for those population and increased frailty and, and finally, and unfortunately increased mortality. So the lesson we have to always remember is to prioritize our influenza vaccination for adults and give the priority always to chronic health condition uh, patients. So this is the conditions that uh, mainly we, found, we find in pe uh, people with influ uh, influenza infection. People are at high risk of getting admitted, getting complication when they have asthma, chronic lung disease, heart disease, which is the max here, 47%, diabetes mellitus, mainly uncontrolled, of course, 43%, and obesity. And when you look at those risk, uh, those chronic conditions, you'll find there's an, a lot of overlap between COVID-19 and influenza, meaning that those two infections will lead to the same complication if you have the current condition. If you have asthma, you, are, it's a, you have like a, a higher likelihood of getting admitted due to complication. The same thing with chronic lung disease with different percentage. The blue represents influenza, yellow represents the COVID of course. Uh, again, heart disease, immune suppression condition, uh, metabolic disorder, diabetes, neurological disorder, obesity. As you can see, obesity is a high risk here for both influenza infection and also COVID-19. So obese people tend to have a, a more severe disease and more admission to the hospital with more complication.
pregnancy, of course, because it's an immunocompromised condition, penal disease, sometimes no condition, but still have high risk. Now let's have another question. Which of the following uh, is common misperception about the influenza vaccine among patients and uh, parents of kids? A, the influenza vaccine can cause the flu. B, the influenza vaccine can cause coronavi coronavirus disease, COVID-19. The influenza vaccine protects against COVID-19, all the above. Unfortunately, all the above. So the influenza vaccine is a killed vaccine. It cannot cause the flu. The influenza vaccine cannot cause, of course, COVID-19 infection. It's a different virus. Influenza vaccine cannot protect again against COVID-19 infection. It's a different virus. So what other uh, misperception we can find about influenza vaccine? One of it is influenza vaccine will give me the flu, as I mentioned uh, in the previous question. And again, it cannot give you the flu because it's a killed virus. It can give you some transient symptoms, mainly body ache, pain in the arm, sometimes low grade temperature, which is transient. One day and goes away, but the flu uh, doesn't give you that. Put in mind that uh, influenza vaccine needs two weeks to work the generation of antibodies uh, will take around two weeks to, to, to be complete. So if you get exposed to influenza within those two weeks, you might get the influenza, but it's not the vaccine. The second misperception or, or uh, misconcept is influenza vaccine cannot uh, be given to a person with egg allergy. This is in the old ages. Now we have recombinant influenza vaccine. It has nothing to do with eggs. It's not cultured in eggs media, so we can give it. The last misconcept, uh, mis uh, uh, misconcept is influenza vaccine is not very effective or important. And this is again a wrong statement. So even if the influenza vaccine is not completely uh, effective, it, it can uh, lessen the severity of a disease, uh, the influenza disease and the symptoms and reduce the risk of complication. So even if you get the, infect, the influenza infection, the virus, you'll have a mild disease without complication. So who should be given the priority for the influenza vaccine? As a general rule, a rule anyone above the age of six months and older should get the vaccine. It's a must. It's the standard. It's the recommendation. Also, person with increased risk of severe illness, as we mentioned, including heart disease, pulmonary disease, uh, diabetes, old age, immunocompromised, obesity, all those people. We also, we should give it to the healthcare workers because they're frontliners and some other uh, workforce. Also, people who might have also complication as we mentioned in the previous slides. Influenza vaccine is not 100% uh, protective. It might be 40% as the last 39% as last year in the US. Uh, but again, if you get the influenza, when you when you already are vaccinated against the influenza uh, with the vaccine, influenza vaccine, you'll have a mild disease. And those uh, vaccines uh, effectiveness uh, are uh, like decided by age, by uh, or by health, uh, the health of the recipient, the degree of the match between the circulating viruses, influenza virus, and the the strains we put in the vaccine. So again, as I said, the influenza vaccine will reduce the severity of the disease. If you get it, you'll get a mild disease and no complications. And it's very preventive, preventable, uh, like the influenza will prevent you from a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, complications. In the US, it prevented 4.4 million cases of influenza and uh, almost 3,500 deaths. What's the challenges when it comes to influenza vaccine? Oh, uh, number one, we have to reach for those with chronic disease. We have to vaccinate them. The main target is to reach for those high risk population. And it's a challenge because now we don't have an opening clinic. We have telemedicine. 
uh, clinic visits are interrupted. And this is a challenge and it should be given for the people who need it the most, as I mentioned before. Also, uh, we it's, one challenge is reducing the strain on the healthcare system. Uh, okay, again, we have some also challenges with logistics. As I said, the clinics, the hospitals, all some, some of the like outpatient clinics and facilities has clo have, have closed because of COVID. And also potential issue related to the co-infection, influenza and SARS-CoV-2, it can complicate the underlying chronic disease of those candidates. So the barriers to the influenza vaccine during this epidemic, this pandemic uh, of COVID-19, number one, there might be fewer worksite uh, vaccination clinics. You know, uh, in the US, for example, 16% of adult receive their vaccination at work. I'm not talking about hospitals. I'm not talking about uh, clinics, about pharmacies. This is just, they will get vaccinated in their companies and then in their factories and their uh, post office, whatever they work, the place they work at. The second barrier is people might not feel safe going to those, even the clinics or the pharmacies. They think if they go there, they might catch the COVID-19 infection. Also in-person clinic visits, might be canceled or moved to the telehealth or teleconsultation. And this is what we've been seeing a lot recently. One barrier also is many people are working from home and it's a challenge. You have to take care of your work, uh, your kids schooling, no time to do any clinic visits for vaccination. A lot of responsibilities, their hands are really full. Another challenge, uh, people might think that they don't need influenza vaccine this year because they are uh, using masks, they, they have uh, like social distancing, but again, the risk is still there. I know it's low, but it's not completely eliminated. Also, there is a concern about the safety uh, of COVID-19 vaccine. People might think if I need the vaccine, the COVID-19 vaccine, uh, and I'm already on influenza vaccine, does it work? Is it uh, safe? And the answer, yes. You know, the, the sign, the, for example, the, the Chinese vaccine we're using in Abu Dhabi, the uh, Sinopharm vaccine, we, we usually give the, vac the uh, influenza vaccine and after two weeks, we can give the COVID-19 vaccine. If we started with the COVID-19, then the influenza vaccine after two weeks and the second dose of the COVID-19 vaccine will be after another two weeks. Again, and every healthcare provider has a role to fight the uh, pandemic and to help with providing the vaccine. They have to access the vaccination, vaccination status of their uh, patients every time they, encounter, they come for the clinic. They have to recommend the vaccine, vaccination, mainly the influenza vaccine. They should administer vac the vaccine whenever it's uh, available or refer to someone who can uh, administer the vaccine and document the vaccine has been received Thank you very much for the uh, for the attend for attending this lecture, and I hope I answered all your questions. And see you soon. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Abdullah. Now we move to the second talk in our session, and it's by Dr. Ashraf Al-Sufi. Dr. Ashraf is a consultant intensivist in my hospital. He's an examiner for the Royal Royal College of Physicians UK. Professor of Medicine at Dubai Medical College, Chair and Chairperson of the Infection Control Committee in Dubai Hospital, UAE. He, Dr. Ashraf will talk to us about infection control issues in the ICU during COVID-19 pandemic. Please, Dr. Ashraf. Thank you very much, Dr. Zulfa. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, in the next 20 minutes, I will be talking about a very important topic, which is actually the challenges which we faced in the intensive care unit during the peak of the COVID-19 crisis, and particularly from infection control point of view. And as you can see, I have used this title for my presentation, and probably I have used it before, those who know me from before. I used this title, War of the World, initially in 2009, when we did have the H1N1 uh, problem, and I use it again when we have the MERS-CoV problem, but I think 
it's very much matching now what we are facing with the uh, COVID-19. Those are some of the learning objectives, which I'm expecting that uh, we achieve some of them by the end of this uh, presentation. I think you all agree with me that the COVID-19 pandemic have really and seriously challenged the healthcare system. And if you look at this statement, you will notice that there is the term suddenly. Suddenly, despite we were aware about the danger of this problem sometime before, I'm not going to talk to you about how the virus came from where it is originated. Is it a, a mutant virus or a man-made virus? This doesn't make much difference. Just look at this slide, which has been released by the WHO back in January 20. And you will notice that by that time, only 4,500 cases were detected worldwide. And I remember this date very particularly because this is the date where we diagnosed the first few, to be exact, four cases in UAE. By that time, everybody was uh, worrying. Should we worry about what is coming? And we, as an infection control practitioner, were concerned about infection control. We uh, started to do a lot of awareness about this. And I remember this slide because I give it myself in January 25. Should we worry? about what is happening in China. And my answer was, instead of being scared, let's be prepared. And this is what we try to do. We give uh, lots of lectures about uh, coronavirus, about what infection control measures we should do, and what we will do if we start to face a high influx of some cases. We even did some drills. But the problem is, we did a drill about a high influx of 20 to 25 cases. By that time, we have all the data which is telling to us, which is actually true, that 80% of the cases of the coronavirus, of this COVID-19, will be always mild and moderate. And only a smaller number will be requiring a hospital admission, and even a smaller number will need an ICU admission. So we were a little bit comfortable by that time, because if we look at the number 4,500, yes, we are ready. But we were not ready for this. We're not ready for 45 million cases. We're not ready for 130,000 cases, which instead of looking at few hundreds admitted to the hospital, we're do, uh, looking at thousands admitted to the hospital. So the definition of difficult times is exactly what did we face during this period. We have to make some desperate changes in the hospitals to accommodate this, like evacuating wards, like stopping the electives, like stopping the OPD, like extending the emergency department and the short stay areas in order to accommodate the people coming, to create a COVID compatible wards and to extend the ICU beds as well as the ICU equipment. That was all good because we have a good support administration wise in order to deal with the logistic problem. But what about the train, the ICU staff? That was the big problem because you can get the rest of the equipment from everywhere, but from where you will get the trained ICU staff. We know that infection control is the cornerstone when you talk about patient safety, and we all know the term. First, do no harm. And we talk about patient safety from all aspects, not only patients, but patients, family, visitors, as well as the healthcare workers. And we do understand that there is no proper patient safety without proper infection control. If you ask anyone who is working in the infection control field, what are the real enemies of infection control? He will answer you without hesitation. It's lack of personnel. This means understaffing. Lack of time, which means an overcrowding. Lack of supplies, in addition to lack of knowledge and training. And where did you see all of this? We have seen it very clearly during the COVID pandemic. I will talk a little about the challenges which we faced because we keep on asking the people about what they should do, but we never ask how they will do during the COVID crisis. We know that the, one of the core functions of the infection control program in high risk areas like ICU is to prevent hospital acquired infection. And if you ask what are the major components to do that, you will talk about a good nurse to patient ratio 
in the presence of a trained ICU staff. We managed to put a lots of uh, bundles of care and those bundles of cares are running in our hospitals for a decade now. And it's very effective in reducing the hospital acquired infections. This is the ventilator bundle, which we are implementing in Dubai hospital. And you can see it has something like eight major components. Those components need to be done concomitantly at all times. Some of those components need to be done every two hours. Some of those components need to be twice or three times per shift. Some of the components might be done in one day. Then ask yourself, what happens during the COVID pandemic? You need a good nurse to patient ratio. You need trained ICU nurses. So ask yourself what happened when you have been overwhelmed by five times increase in the number of patients we're dealing with in ICU. Now, components of the bundle, like mouth care, like subglottic suction, like cuff pressure adjustment, like a condensate drainage. How you will be asking the nurses to keep on doing that while they are scared from the infection risk. All of those maneuvers are, are uh, associated with circuit interruption and aerosol generating procedures. So you are asking the nurses to keep on doing the standard of care and we're not giving them the proper assurance how they will protect themselves from this particular aerosol generating procedure. We kept on asking them to use sometimes the closed suction circuit. It's a good solution because you will be able to prevent the aerosol generation and the dispersion of the droplets everywhere when you use this suction catheter. We sometimes say it is also beneficial to prevent the loss of PEEP, which is usually uh, important in ventilating an ARDS COVID pneumonia patients. But what was the problem with the closed suction circuits? In normal circumstances, when you do have a 20 patients in the ICU, one or two of them will have an ARDS, one or two of them will have an infectious origin which require a closed suction circuit. But when you have 100 intubated patients, all of them are infectious, all of them are in ARDS and requiring closed circuit ventilation, then the supply for the closed circuit suctions, one year supply will be exhausted in five to seven days. And I mentioned initially that one of the major enemies of infection control uh, standard practice is the lack of supply. We try to improvise. We try to tell the nurses that by the time you're doing the disconnection, switch off the ventilator. But once you disconnect the patient, both the ventilator and the patient will disperse droplets into the air, increasing the air aerosol generating uh, procedure. We sometimes even clamp the tube in a trial to reduce this problem. But this will tell you how difficult it was to deal with what we consider as a standard practice during the COVID pandemic. One extra issue, the proning. It has been mentioned in all the guidelines that it is one of the standard methods you improve the oxygenation to the COVID-19 ARDS. Just look at the picture and you will realize that it needs a manpower like six nurses plus one doctor in order to perform the uh, proning. Now, this is acceptable in the standard daily care when you have one or two ARDS cases per ward. But when you had 15 to 20 patients to be prone, you are in need to make nurses available to do this job. You need people who are available for between 200 to 400 minutes per shift in order just to prone and deprone the patient. And if those nurses are busy doing this, then other patients will suffer from the less standard of care because they are doing what looks like the standard of care for other patients. And look at this patient who is prone and ask yourself how the components of the bundle will be implemented, how you will keep the head up, how you will do the subglottic suction, how you will do the mouth care. So the COVID pandemic have really stressed us a lot even the standard of care, which we consider that is fundamental to uh, practice to reduce the HAI was very difficult to implement. Look at the sedation break. We normally always advise to decrease the sedation, to allow the patient to wake up, to allow the patient to breathe spontaneously. And it's been documented that this is, will decrease the duration of mechanical ventilation and then improve the time. But how you will do that 
if you decrease the sedation to a patient who is already COVID positive. So by the time you have the risk for self-extubation or laryngeal injury or circuit disconnection or emergency intubation, all those procedures will increase the possibility of aerosol generating. So on one hand, you want to do the sedation break in order to improve and to decrease the time on the ventilator. On the other hand, you are not able to do it because you are afraid that you will increase the risk of infection to the healthcare workers. As a result of this, you will find that the majority of patients in the intensive care unit, if not all, have been deeply sedated for quite some time till the patient at least will become COVID negative. Because you know, if you win an extubate and COVID positive patient, how the respiratory therapist will come later on to do the chest physiotherapy, breathing exercises and cough ATK. It will become a problem. And what was the outcome of the excessive sedation? This is what we know. The prolonged ventilation and the prolonged excessive use of sedation have resulted in a lot of ventilator dependency. Look at our wards now. We have a lots of patients with tracheostomy who are ventilator dependent, not only because of the effect of COVID pneumonia, destructive effect of COVID pneumonia on the lung, but because of the severe muscle weakness or the critical care polyneuropathy, which resulted later on that too many patients are already colonized with multidrug resistant organism, something which is seriously affecting the patient's safety. The same did happen in the central line and in the urinary catheter bundle. As a result of this, we did have a very high rates of VAPs, CLAPSI, CAUTI. It was surging above what we know from the benchmarking over the last decade. Not only that, because of this kind of infection, we have a higher rate of sepsis. And because of that, we have a higher rate of multi-organ dysfunction and an excessive use of multi-drug uh, excessive use of broad spectrum antibiotic, which resulted later on in the production of too much uh, multidrug resistant uh, organisms. That was a serious draw blow to the patient safety concept, which we are all from the infection control point of view are working on it. The point next, which I would like to mention is the impact on the antimicrobial stewardship. And I think it's been mentioned several times today it's part of the guidelines. The guidelines have told us that in mechanically ventilated patients with severe COVID pneumonia, you are allowed to give empiric antimicrobials. So what was the problem? The problem is every patient who has been admitted to the hospital who requires some oxygen therapy have been started on broad spectrum antibiotic. And the reason for that, everybody is afraid because there is no clear guidelines to tell the people what to do just in case it is a co-infection, just in case it is a super infection, let's use the antibiotic because we don't know what is happening. Despite the guidelines have been completely uh, uh, revised several times and all the newer versions of the guidelines is telling to people to be more careful about choosing the antibiotic and not to routinely give it to patients with COVID pneumonia, yet, the real-time practice have proved different from that because the people are still using the antibiotics routinely for every patient, not only for ICU or ventilated patients. Nearly all the patients are completing uh, uh, some courses of third-generation cephalosporin. And you know already that regardless with the biomarkers of infections, which is detected or not detected, anyone who's been started on antibiotics, they don't usually stop it. So any deterioration in patient condition, regardless to if it is infectious or non-infectious, based on some deterioration in the X-ray, the antibiotics will be escalated, will be changed, will become in a combination. So the majority of patients with COVID pneumonia who's been admitted to ICU, because patient does not come to ICU from the first day of being admitted with COVID pneumonia, they usually come after five to seven days because this is the natural course of deterioration of the disease. So we usually receive the patient in the intensive care unit after he already received a course of cefotriaxone Zestromax. Then after that, most probably the antibiotic had been upgraded to a pepercillin tazobactam plus a levofloxacin. Then if we are not lucky, we will see the patient already started on some carbapenem plus amikacin. 
Possibly an antifungal will be added as well because everybody is afraid that this patient is already on steroid. All of this is done based on the progression in the X-ray, despite we know that this is part of the natural progression of the COVID pneumonia itself. The end result of this, that most of the patients who develop device-related or hospital-acquired pneumonias after all these courses of antibiotic, you can imagine what kind of bacterial environment will be available to cause the infection after you use all of this. We all know the story of the collateral damage of antibiotic. If you give a broad spectrum antibiotic, you will probably kill all the green sensitive bacteria. And the only bacteria remaining in the field is the red resistant bacteria. And under the continuous pressure of the antibiotic, the only regrowing bacteria will be the resistant one. And we all know that the more you use kephalosporins and quinolones, and the more you use carbapenem, the more you will have ESBL producing enterobacteriaceae, followed by a carbapenem resistant uh, organisms, which will later on be transferred, not only from the enterobacteriaceae, but the pseudomonas and the rest of the gram negative bacteria. So during this time, because of the unclarity of the guidelines, which recommended that people with severe COVID pneumonia need to be on empiric antibiotics, everybody was using antibiotics, not only a simple one, but a high ceiling antibiotic in combinations, which result in a lot of collateral damage. So during this period, we have seen a lot of ESBL, a lot of a carbapenem resistant gram negative bacteria. In addition to the reasons which we mentioned before, about the inability to implement the standard of uh, uh, ventilator-associated pneumonia prevention bundles, CLAPSI prevention bundle, CAUTI prevention bundle. This results in an extremely increased uh, amount of broad spectrum and combination antibiotic use. And the end result of this is mar marked increase in the multidrug resistant. Ask yourself again, what was the impact on both morbidity and mortality and ask yourself, what is the impact on the patient's safety? So when I say at the beginning that the COVID pandemic seriously challenging the healthcare system, despite we already saw it coming and we saw all the early warning signs, yet we were not able to uh, get ready uh, properly. We learned the lesson, but we learned it hard way. It was a painful experience, but fortunately, our colleagues from the front line, they were highly dedicated and committed. It's safe to say that the best practice was extremely difficult to achieve. It's very easy to tell the people what to do, but it's very difficult to tell them how to do, particularly during this difficult time. One final say, that the best practice based on the guidelines should always be dependent on realism, not idealism. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Ashraf, for the nice presentation illustrating the challenges with COVID-19. And I can't agree more with you, the biggest challenges, which is the manpower, which we really face I'm still facing with the testing uh, aspect of COVID-19. Uh, now we move to the third presentation in our session by Dr. Uh, Jihad Al-Malk. Uh, Dr. Jihad is a clinical professor of medicine, Cleveland Clinic, Lerner College of Medicine, consultant critical care medicine and deputy section head critical care institute, Cleveland Clinic, Abu Dhabi. Dr. Uh, Professor Jihad will talk to us about lessons learned from COVID-19 uh, ICU case studies. Please, Dr. Jihad. Okay, thank you so much for the uh, introduction. Thank you uh, for Dr. Najiba for uh, inviting me. Uh, I will start uh, uh, to talk about antiviral treatment in, in uh, COVID-19 patients. Uh, uh, the first slides about how these drugs uh, work. Uh, 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 chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine uh, inhibit uh, the viral entry into the cells. Lopinavir inhibits the uh, three chymotrypsin like protease, and remdesivir inhibits the viral RNA dependent RNA uh, polymerase. Uh, 
so we'll start with uh, hydroxychloroquine and uh, hospitalized COVID-19 patients. As you know, many studies were published about hydroxychloroquine. Uh, most of them were retrospective studies with low, uh, very low uh, uh, quality evidence. I will talk about the two big uh, multicenter uh, randomized controlled uh, uh, trials, uh, the recovery trial and the uh, WHO. Uh, uh, solidarity trial. And the recovery trial, 1,561 patients were assigned to receive hydroxychloroquine 800 milligram loading dose followed by 200 milligram uh, BID for 10 days and 3,155 patients were assigned to receive usual uh, care. Most of these patients, 60% of these patients were uh, receiving oxygen and the time, the median time from hospitalization to uh, randomization was uh, uh, only uh, three days. And the uh, uh, primary outcome was all-cause mortality was in 28 days. And as you can see, the mortality rate was not significantly different between hydroxychloroquine and uh, usual care. And when we look at the uh, 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 secondary outcomes, actually a uh, usual uh, care did better than hydroxychloroquine. 63% uh, of patients in the usual care were discharged from hospital within 28 days compared to 60% in the hydroxychloroquine group, and this uh, difference was uh, statistically uh, significant. 31% uh, 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 of patients in the hydroxychloroquine required invasive mechanical ventilation or died compared to only 27% in the usual care, and this difference also was significant, uh, this, uh, significantly, uh, 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 statistically significant. Uh, and when we look at the uh, solidarity trial, we have also the same findings. Uh, uh, the mortality rate was in 28 days was not significantly different between hydroxychloroquine and the control group. Uh, so what about uh, lopinavir and the ritonavir uh, in uh, uh, COVID-19 patients in this, uh, this randomized controlled uh, open-label trials that included patients with severe COVID infection uh, that uh, was uh, oxygen saturation of 94% on room air or PF ratio less than 300 millimeter of mercury. Patients were randomly assigned to receive uh, uh, Calitra uh, or uh, standard uh, of care and the primary outcome was uh, time to clinical improvement. 99, percent, 99 patients were uh, assigned to receive Calitra and 100 uh, patients were assigned to receive uh, a standard of care and 70% of these patients were uh, requiring supplemental uh, oxygen and the median time from illness onset to randomization was 13 days. And as you can see in this slide, the primary outcome, which was the clinic, a time to clinical improvement, was not significantly different between uh, uh, Calitra and control group. And when we look at the secondary outcomes, all of the secondary outcomes, mortality was in 28 days, ICU length of stay or duration of invasive mechanical ventilation were not significantly different between Calitra and the standard uh, care. And uh, actually also, uh, uh, Calitra was not associated with high uh, uh, viral cleanness rate uh, compared to the control group. And uh, in the recovery trial, uh, most, more than 1,600 patients were assigned to receive uh, Calitra and more than 3,400 patients were assigned to see, receive usual care. Most of these patients, 70%, were also requiring supplemental oxygen and the median time from uh, uh, hospitalization to uh, uh, randomization was only two days. And in this trial, again, mortality rate was not significantly different between Calitra and usual care. And also, uh, when we look at the secondary outcome, uh, discharge from uh, hospital within 20 days or receipt of invasive mechanical ventilation or death, uh, all of these uh, uh, secondary outcomes were not significantly different between the two uh, groups. And we have the same findings uh, in the solidarity trial, the mortality rate was not significantly different between lopinavir and uh, 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 the control group. Uh, so I'm going to talk quickly about remdesivir. I saw that there is a presentation after my uh, lecture about remdesivir. And this uh, ACTT uh, double-blind randomized uh, placebo-controlled uh, trial uh, uh, 
531 patients received uh, 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 remdesivir compared to 521 patients who received only placebo. And patient, uh, most of these patients, 41%, also were uh, requiring supplemental uh, oxygen. And the median time from onset to randomization was only nine days. The primary outcome was time to clinical improvement. And we can see uh, uh, in uh, this slide, uh, in all patient, uh, 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 and the remdesivir group, uh, uh, the time to clinical improvement was shorter compared to the uh, placebo group. However, in patients who were not receiving oxygen uh, therapy, there was no difference between remdesivir and placebo group regarding the primary outcome. Uh, uh, and patients who were uh, on oxygen therapy, uh, uh, remdesivir was associated with shorter clinical uh, 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 time to clinical improvement compared to a placebo. However, in severe patients who required who were requiring high oxygen flow or non-invasive mechanical ventilation or uh, uh, invasive mechanical ventilation during the study, remdesivir was not significantly different from, uh, from placebo regarding the time to clinical improvement. Uh, and uh, reg regarding the secondary outcomes, we can see that the percent of patients uh, that uh, required a new uh, non-invasive uh, uh, ventilation or high flow oxygen therapy was less uh, in the uh, remdesivir group compared to the placebo group and the percent of patients that required invasive mechanical ventilation or ECMO was also less, uh, significantly less in the remdesivir group compared to the placebo group. However, in the solidarity trial, the mortality rate within 28 days was not significantly different between the disease group and control group. And when they combined the two studies, the uh, ACTT and the solidarity trial as meta-analysis, uh, overall, uh, remdesivir was not associated with a, a lower mortality rate compared to a, a standard of care. A few uh, 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 words about interferon in the solidarity trial. As you can see in this slide, mortality rate again was not uh, significantly different between interferon group and uh, standard of care. So I'll move, I will move uh, uh, to talk about immunomodulator treatment in severe COVID-19 patients. I will talk about corticosteroids, tocilizumab, and convalescent plasma. We'll start with uh, uh, corticosteroids and the uh, uh, recovery trial. Uh, 2000, uh, more than 2,000 patients were assigned to receive dexamethasone, 6 milligram uh, daily for uh, 10 days, and more than uh, 4,300 patients were assigned to, usual, to receive usual care. Most of these patients, 60%, were uh, the Requiring supplemental oxygen, uh, oxygen and the median time from uh, hospitalization to uh, treatment was uh, two days. And as you can see, in all patients, dexamethasone was associated with a lower mortality rate compared to usual care. Uh, also, patients who were uh, receiving mechanical ventilation and oxygen uh, therapy were uh, 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 benefited more uh, 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 of dexamethasone than patients who were not uh, receiving uh, oxygen uh, therapy. Uh, what about tocilizumab in this uh, retrospective uh, cohort study? Uh, 433 patients uh, uh, who received uh, uh, tocilizumab was in uh, uh, two days of ICU admission, were well compared to 3,491 patients who did not receive tocilizumab during the uh, two days, the first two days of ICU admissions. And after uh, advanced statistical analysis with propulsive score matching, uh, the authors found that the mortality rate was actually lower in the tocilizumab group compared to patients who did not receive tocilizumab group within uh, the first two days of ICU admission. However, in this uh, uh, randomized controlled uh, trial uh, that included patients with severe uh, uh, or moderate uh, pneumonia, pneumonia requiring at least three liters of oxygen, uh, but without ventilation or admission to intensive care, uh, uh, 63 patients were assigned to receive uh, uh, tocilizumab, 8 mg per kg on day one, and day three if uh, clinically uh, required, and 67 patients were assigned to receive a standard of care, and the uh, median time from uh, hospital admission to uh, randomization was uh, uh, only one day. Uh, and we can see in this slide there was no significant different, uh, uh, difference between tocilizumab and usual care regarding uh, uh, mortality within 28 days, and even uh, 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 there was no significant difference between the two groups regarding the progression of, of, of disease uh, to mechanical ventilation, high flow, non high flow uh, oxygen therapy, or non invasive ventilation at day uh, 14. 
And, another, and this also another study, uh, uh, randomized controlled study that was uh, uh, that included patients also with a severe uh, COVID-19 pneumonia that uh, uh, was a PI fresh with a, a, a between 200 and 300 millimeter of mercury. Uh, uh, 60 patients were assigned to receive tocilizumab 8 mg per kg, uh, compared to 66 patients who were assigned to receive only standard of care. And you can see that the uh, uh, median time from uh, hospital admission to randomization was only uh, two days. And again, the study was negative. There was no significant difference between uh, uh, tocilizumab and the standard of care regarding the primary outcome, which, which was a clinical uh, uh, worsening or hospital discharge rates. And when we look at the secondary outcomes, uh, admission to ICU, uh, deaths or discharges at day 14 and 30, all uh, these secondary outcomes were not uh, statistically significant between tocilizumab and uh, 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 standard of care. And in this uh, uh, recent studies, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, it's a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial uh, that included patients with severe uh, uh, COVID-19 infection uh, that needed uh, supplemental oxygen in order to maintain uh, an oxygen saturation of 90% uh, and above. Uh, these patients were randomly assigned to uh, receive tocilizumab 8 mg per kg or standard of care, and the median time from uh, 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 symptom onset to uh, randomization was only nine days. And in these studies, uh, the primary outcome, which was mechanical ventilation or death, was not significantly different, uh, different between uh, 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 the two groups uh, on day 14 and on day 28. Uh, now we're going to move uh, to convalescent plasma. Uh, this uh, uh, multi-center randomized con uh, control trial that was performed in uh, Wuhan, China, and uh, uh, included uh, patients with severe or life-threatening COVID infection uh, disease. This trial was uh, terminated early after uh, included only 103 patients of a planet uh, uh, of 200 patients. Uh, 52 patients were assigned to receive convalescent plasma compared to 51 uh, 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 usual care and the time, uh, the median time uh, uh, from a, a symptom onset to a convalescent plasma was 12 days. And uh, uh, regarding the primary outcome, which was a time to clinical improvement, uh, in all patients, we can see there was no significant difference uh, between convalescent plasma and control group. However, in patients who received, who were uh, uh, who had a severe disease, basically on oxygen therapy, convalescent plasma was associated with a shorter time to clinical improvement, uh, and this finding was not uh, 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 find, uh, uh, found for uh, patients who, were, who had a life-threatening uh, disease. And uh, this uh, 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 multi-center randomized control study that uh, just published in BMG and was performed in, uh, in India. Uh, this uh, uh, trial included patients with severe COVID infection uh, disease with PF ratio between 200 and uh, 300 millimeter of mercury. 235 patients were assigned to receive convalescent plasma and the standard of care compared to 229 patients who received only uh, standard of care. The uh, uh, primary outcome was uh, composite of uh, progression to severe disease or uh, uh, all cause mortality at 28 days. Uh, as you can see here, uh, uh, from uh, the, the median time from symptom onset to enrollment was only eight uh, days. And uh, uh, there was no significant different be difference between convalescent plasma and uh, usual care regarding the primary outcome, which was all cause uh, mortality or progression of se uh, to severe disease. And when we look at the patients who received convalescent plasma with uh, detectable neutralizing antibodies, again, uh, there was no significant difference between the two groups regarding the primary outcome. Uh, and uh, uh, all inflammatory markers were not significantly different uh, between the two uh, groups on day one. Uh, on, uh, on admission day three and day seven. I'm going to talk a little bit about anticoagulation and severe COVID-19 patients. As you uh, uh, know, many, many uh, studies reported high incidence of thrombotic uh, events uh, in, in uh, uh, these patients. Uh, and many uh, experts advocate, advocated the use of therapeutic anticoagulation in these patients, even without con uh, confirmed diagnosis of thrombotic uh, event. However, uh, uh, some studies also reported high incidence of uh, uh, major bleeding in these uh, patients. 
Uh, we recently published a, a paper uh, uh, in which we evaluated the impact of uh, a protocol, uh, our uh, thromboprophylactic uh, uh, protocol that we uh, developed for COVID-19 patients uh, based on the dimer level, where the dimer level uh, uh, are less than two micrograms per milliliter. We used only a standard prophylaxis uh, with enoxaparin 40 milligram uh, uh, daily, and when one was when uh, the dimer level. Uh, was uh, higher than two micrograms per milliliter. We used high intensity uh, uh, prophylaxis with enoxaparin 40 milligram BID. We included uh, 188 patients and we found that the incidence of thrombotic events uh, was actually about 12%, which was uh, much less than what it's reported before. And in uh, our multi-variable multi, uh, logistic regression analysis, we found that high intensity prophylaxis was associated with lower uh, uh, risk of thrombotic events, uh, 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 but not the ther uh, therapeutic anticoagulation, which, which was associated with uh, high uh, incidence of major bleeding. So maybe uh, 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 high intensity prophylactic uh, uh, regimen uh, can be useful in uh, these uh, uh, patients. To conclude, uh, uh, I think we have a strong evidence now to stop using hydroxychloroquine, calitra, and interferon in severe COVID-19 patients. Uh, I think we can still maybe uh, use remdesivir uh, in a severe COVID-19 patients that uh, uh, requiring oxygen therapy, not uh, uh, high flow or non-invasive or a patient who are already intubated. And I think we have very good evidence for using corticosteroids and severe COVID-19 patients uh, requiring oxygen therapy. And uh, so far, there's, well, uh, there's no evidence for using uh, convalescent plasma or TCD you have in severe COVID-19 patients, except for uh, research purposes. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Jihad, for this nice overview of the COVID-19 ICU case uh, studies and the uh, lesson learned. Uh, now we move to the fourth presentation in this session. Uh, our next uh, presentation will be by Dr. Uh, Alex Soriano about the evidence of remdesivir use in COVID-19. Dr. Alex is estimate fellow, head of infectious diseases department hospital of Barcelona, the assistant professor, University of Barcelona, vice president of the European Bone and Joint Infection Society, Spain. Please, Dr. Alex. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. Okay, th these are the, the three questions that I wanted to address during my lecture. The, the first one is how important is the virus? I mean, the, the amount of virus that my patient had, because we have been so focused on the anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, on the uh, potential activity of uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the drugs that are able to block uh, interleukins, et cetera. Uh, but unfortunately, antivirals have, need, have not uh, succeed as uh, we wanted, but maybe, one of the problems is that the precise moment for being active with an antiviral is not well understood. The, the second question will be, okay, if, if we understand this a little bit better, when stopping or which has, are the potential impact of stopping viral replication earlier? And the third is whether the solution and the difference between some of the data that uh, we have um, uh, that we have in the in the literature can be explained the differences because of different moments of the administration and whether the early administration of antibiotic would be a better uh, a better solution. Well, in terms of the in terms of the uh, vital dynamics and the inflammatory response in in COVID. Uh, it has been already uh, described, but uh, just here I'm going to show you the time in days. And as you can see here, we know that in patients with a good uh, outcome of the infection, what happens is that the vital replication is stopped by the immune response. And this is what happens in the majority of the patients indeed. I mean, more than 80% of the population 
had an asymptomatic or mild disease and uh, recovers thanks to the, uh, to the immune response that is adequate and able to control the viral infection. However, in, in some of the, uh, of the patients, uh, if we can go on, I don't know why now it's not going on. Sorry. Yeah, okay. Uh, but uh, some patients uh, uh, have a, a progressive and, and a longer period of time under uh, constant replication. You can see here the, the green dashed line uh, where for some reasons not very well understood, but the patients, some of the patients remain with uh, constant, re with uh, uh, prolonged replication. And what happens is that uh, probably the inflammatory response or the immune response, particularly in patients, in all patients, maybe because of immunosenescence, some particular comorbidities, and here I would include uh, especially those patients with cardiovascular diseases, uh, that at least in my experience, they have significantly worse outcome. Or maybe particularly in young people with some genetic traits described recently in science related with the interferon type 1 response, for whatever the reason, the immunity uh, is not able to control the viral replication. And in the end, some of the patients develop a cytokine uh, release syndrome that uh, evolves in a pneumonia, distress, thrombosis, shock, multi-organ failure, or whatever in this, in this uh, progression. And this is, of course, the picture in moderate to severe disease and uh, in patients with immune suppression. And what happened, uh, if we can go to the next one. Okay. Okay. So, uh, okay. So uh, this is just an example of um, when the vital replication occurs in patients with a severe disease. These are 89 patients in intensive care and 40 patients in medium care. Uh, in intensive care, the majority of them, 81, uh, were under mechanical ventilation. And what I'm showing you here is in terms of the days from symptom onset in the X, um, uh, uh, here down, and in the other axis, uh, what we can see is the number of RNA copies. And uh, what, what the authors did was to culture this putum of these patients, not only to measure the RNA copies, but also to culture. And what they observed is that in this particular subgroup of patients uh, with a severe infection, uh, the, the, um, uh, the uh, possibility to identify viruses was limited to the first 20 days, but particularly during the first uh, 10 to 15 days is the only uh, time when it's possible to isolate virus in, in vital cultures. And this is correlated with a high uh, RNA copies, only when uh, the, uh, there are more than six locks of uh, RNA copies it was possible to identify viruses. So even in so severe uh, patients, the virus, the replicating and uh, uh, viable viruses uh, can, find, uh, can be fine within the first 15 days, 10 to 15 days in the majority of cases, and when the RNA copies are so high. Well, this is important because uh, one of the uh, interesting things, and I'm going to show you data with uh, data from my from my institution um, uh, where we analyzed the impact on mortality of the vital load measure at the day of admission and we measure the vital load according to the ct you know that the uh, polymer change reaction provides us with the ct with the cycle threshold and as you know, there is an inverse relation, correlation between the CT 
and the uh, vital load. And the lowest, the CT, the highest, the vital load. And according to these, we can differentiate the population in these three groups, those with low vital load, medium vital load, and high vital load. And what we can observe is that these populations are a little bit different. I mean, the highest the vital load, the older the people, uh, more than 70 years old, shorter the periods, the, 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 the days of, from symptom onset to be admitted in the hospital. And although the inflammatory and the oxygen uh, saturation was more, was more or less similar, the need of ICU was higher in those patients with higher vital load. But the most important thing that I wanted to show you here in the next slide is that the mortality was significantly correlated. And according to the multivariate analysis, those patients with a CT value below 25 was significantly associated and these patients had, with, sorry, with mortality, and these patients had two times higher mortality rate. As you can see here, low vital load, mortality rate of 10%, intermediate 20% 20%, and higher vital load, almost 30% mortality rate. So the viruses at the beginning are impacting on the outcome of the patient. And uh, particularly here, as you can see, in the mortality. So it's evident from here that if we are able to decrease from the very beginning, the total amount of viruses, probably it will impact on the outcome of my patient. So let me go to the next slide, trying to answering uh, the, the, next, uh, the next topic. Um, sorry. Uh, the next topic that, it, that it's, um, what is it would be theoretically the potential of a stopping viral replication earlier in, the, in, in, in this process? Let me go to the next slide. Of course, what we can expect is that if we stop the, vi the viral replication early in the process or for severe patients, of course, we are talking about severe patients and uh, the, uh, we are accordingly reducing the pressure over the immune system, what we can expect is that the, uh, if we can go to the next slide, we can relax the immune system and avoid the development of pneumonia or at least the progression of the pneumonia to distress, thrombosis, et cetera. I think that this is more than reasonable to hypothesize that if we are able to do this, I mean, to stop the viral replication, we will be able to, uh, to stop the, the problem. In, in line with this, the real thing is that the only one potent in vitro antiviral agent that we have is remdesivir. And remdesivir, uh, um, as you know, blocks the synthesis of RNA, uh, uh, RNA of the viruses by inhibiting the polymerase the RNA-dependent uh, uh, RNA polymerase. So if we can go on uh, in the next slides, uh, what we can see here is how the polymerase is uh, synthesizing the uh, template that will be uh, necessary for the uh, production of multiple copies of the positive RNA uh, of the viruses that finally will uh, destroy the cell and will go to infect the next cell. And in line with this, what happens with remdesivir, if we can go on, is that remdesivir is an analog of, nu of native nucleosides. In concrete, if we can go on, um, remdesivir is an analog of adenosine. And uh, we have to realize that there are important differences with, for example, rivabirin or faripiravir that are to analogs of guanosine. Uh, first of all, uh, if we analyze the efficiency, uh, if we can go on, if we analyze the, the efficacy or the selectivity, if you want, in terms of the, um, uh, how efficient is the polymerase to incorporate remdesivir or to incorporate all the other uh, antiviral agents, what we can observe is that taking as a reference the original nucleotide, uh, the uh, ribavirin, faripiravir uh, had a significantly less 
uh, efficiency in terms of incorporation. However, remdesivir is even more effective than the natural nucleotides to be incorporated in, uh, by the polymerase. And secondly, and this is interesting because what happens when, when the polymerase incorporates rivabirin is that immediately the exonuclease is um, uh, changing rivabirin, uh, correcting this mistake. And so it makes the uh, rivabirin completely uh, ineffective. However, remdesivir, what happens with remdesivir is, is that when remdesivir is incorporated into the chain, the uh, next three nucleotides uh, that comes afterwards introduce a stop codon, and so it interrupts the synthesis of the RNA. Therefore, the uh, exonuclease has no time to correct the problem of remdesivir. And so for, doing, for, for these reasons, this uh, new antiviral is more potent than the others. I'm not going to extend too much in the data from the final report of this uh, uh, trial that it has been already presented, but it's important to, rem to remember that this was a double blind placebo control trial. So this is the best level of evidence in the literature. And uh, what they say is that Rendesivir was associated with a shorter period of time to recover. And I think that this is not a minor issue because uh, the in, in, in absolute numbers, if we can go to the next slide, in terms of absolute numbers, as you can see uh, in, in, this, in this overall population, uh, the, with more than 500 cases in each arm, the remdesivir arm uh, take uh, five days shorter to acquire the um, stability and the, and the recovery of the patient. Five days is more than 30% than the control group. And I think that this is quite relevant, but uh, it seems that everybody only focuses on mortality. And in my impression, this is completely mistake, but of course mortality is important. And indeed, if we go to the next one, it's evident that in terms of mortality, the, there was a decrease in the placebo uh, versus the placebo, 10% in our remdesivir versus 14% in the, in the placebo. And this difference was not statistically significant, but the p-value was 0 0.07. But interestingly, if we go ahead with the next, uh, with the next slide, sorry, with the next, um, uh, what we can observe is that in the population that require admission with supplement of low flow oxygen, there was a significant reduction in the time to recovery, seven days versus nine days. But interestingly, I think that it, there is a very important information here that uh, I will translate into the percentage. Uh, as you can see here, the percentage of mortality in the remdesivir arm with more than 200 cases here in remdesivir versus placebo, the mortality rate was 3.9 versus 12%. And this, in terms of the adjustment, it was a, a reduction in the 70% of the mortality rate. I think that this is not a minor in a very well-performed trial and by an independent agency. This is not a GILEA trial. This is a trial from the NIH, I mean, an independent American agency. And what it's interesting to observe also is that the mortality rate, oh, so sorry, um, uh, uh, the mortality rate is uh, similar in, in the scale five than in the scale four that were less severe patients. But it's true. Once the patient requires high flu oxygen or um, uh, mechanical ventilation, the difference in mortality completely disappear. And this is reasonable. Probably we don't have this detail, but probably what happens is that at, day, at the scale four, scale five patients, had probably a shorter duration of symptoms, but when the patient requires mechanical ventilation, probably this patient has less amount of viruses and the problem is more related with inflammatory response. This is just the survival curve in, in, the, in those patients with a score, with baseline ordinal score of five. It was quite clear the difference in terms of, of mortality that I think is not a minor point uh, when we are talking about severe pneumonia. Uh, 
if we can go on. Uh, this is just a, a difference that we can go on in order not, not, not to uh, not to go so far. But again, this is a retrospective analysis where patients uh, evaluated in a hospital without remdesivir, but with the, the same characteristics according to a matching analysis the, to those patients that receive remdesivir in, in a trial uh, that was performed in a different hospital, the difference in mortality adjusted for other variables was indeed statistically significant, 12% versus 7%. But of course, this is a, a, a retrospective uh, analysis with, of course, a different level of evidence. Uh, this is uh, just a trial with remdesivir in a subgroup population with uh, less severity. I mean, with those patients with moderate COVID-19 with a low mortality rate. But um, what I wanted to... What I wanted to show you is just that those patients that received remdesivir uh, were discharged um, more uh, uh, more frequently at day 11, at day 14, and at day 28, although with the, the level of significance was different uh, in, in the different time points. What happens then with solidarity? Well, solidarity, as it has been mentioned, uh, uh, refuses hydroxychloroquine, caletra, interferon, and with remdesivir, still in still in is not um, stop this arm. So they consider that still maybe there is something behind, but it's true that they were not able to demonstrate a significant reduction in the mortality. And this is the picture. No? The picture that everybody has in mind is, okay, no difference in mortality. But remember that this is an open label without placebo. The outcome was only mortality. There was no measurement on the time to recovery. And the time, and this is the most important point, the time point of remdesivir administration from symptom onset is not provided in the paper. And I wanted to show you how important is this in the following, uh, in the following two slides. But before, just a comment, they perform a subanalysis of the population by mixing the population with low flow and high flow oxygen requirement. And by doing so, they observe a little bit advantage, but not significant in terms of mortality. I wanted to insist on that. Here we are talking about mortality, but it's true that uh, there was no statistically significant. But here, let me start with some few comments, if we can go on to the next slide, about something that is important. Uh, how important is to be so early, earlier in, an, in a viral infection? In my previous slide, I don't want it to lose time, but I, uh, I, I show you in the, in, in the previous one uh, just that for influenza, we know well that every day of delay in the administration of a of those patients that require ICU admission is associated with a decrease in the survival rate. And we know that from, from a viral infection. And here in COVID, we know that the, the, the viral replication is something like this, as I mentioned you in the first slides. And here we see which is the window of opportunity for an, an antiviral agent. I mean, an antiviral agent administered after 15 days probably has no effective because there are no viruses. No, because it's not effective. It's because, because the viruses are not the main issue. And just you to uh, observe what happens, if we can go on with the next points, okay, up to here. Uh, if we look at the remdesivir first trial comparing with placebo, published in Lancet, no benefit. The mean number of days from symptom onset that were the patients included in remdesivir was 11 days. I mean, so late. The other three trials, um, uh, including the, the, the one from the NIH, day nine is not so, I mean, uh, I would prefer to be even so earlier. And finally, there is another trial in, 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 in non-severe patients comparing Calitra, Rigavirina, Interferon versus Calitra published in Lancet that it was administered very early in the process of infection, I mean, day five. And they were able to demonstrate significant differences in the outcome, not in mortality because it was in, in non-severe patients, but in terms of clinical improvement was statistically significantly better for interferon, yeah? But it was administered quite earlier. We don't know exactly when interferon was administered in solidarity and in solidarity it has been refused. But of course, interferon administered later than 10 days would be a mistake because it's an inflammatory phase 
and to provide an, a pro-inflammatory drug is not a good choice, yeah? Uh, but if you administer interferon at the very beginning, what would be happen? According to this trial, administered earlier, you're able to improve the outcome of your patient. So it really matters at what moment we administer an antiviral agent, of course. And still we have plenty of space to improve the good results indeed from remdesivir. Uh, just uh, to show you, if we amplify in the next, uh, okay, thank you, the SIP analysis in the final report of the New England Journal of Medicine, the authors clearly state that the benefit is even higher when they select for the population that received the drug within the first 10 days. And this is reasonable. Every drug that is, I mean, every antiviral administered later than 10 days, particularly later than 12 days, probably is not helpful. And the problem is that if we can review here um, in, in the next uh, point also, in the next point also, please, um, what we can observe is that Wuhan, China, 11 days administer no benefit. Low flow oxygen, nine days median administration, important difference in favor of remdesivir in terms of mortality, yeah? And solidarity, what happens? We don't know. The data when the antiviral was administered, unfortunately is not provided in the paper. But this is absolutely critical because if the drug was administered later than 10 days, then it's reasonable. Here it's not effective. If the drug was administered in this trial within the first 10 days, then of course, we will need to analyze exactly which is the difference, but we need this data to clearly respond to these questions. Otherwise, it's very difficult. This is just my experience. Uh, we started to, to use a remdesivir as a, um, in, in, in our compassionate use program uh, from July. Now we have more- Sorry, than, we're running uh, short of time. Yeah, yeah, just finished. This is my thing. Uh, my uh, almost last slide, just to show you that the mortality in those patients receiving remdesivir was 3.6%, so uh, uh, low mortality in patients that require admission. And so uh, this is my, my last slide. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Alex, for the uh, evidence uh, for remdesivir use in COVID-19. Thank you very much. Uh, I would sincerely like to thank our speakers for the great presentation despite their busy duty uh, during this time of the pandemic. I would also like to thank our sponsor GSK, our organizers, Info Plus, and most of all, the audience. I hope these two sessions on the 9th and today have added value to your daily practice. See you next year, inshallah, in our next uh, ICMR conference. We are hoping for the moment uh, to be uh, tentatively uh, on the 18th and 19th of March, 2021. So thank you all for staying with us. <laughs>